Hello, and welcome to Humans of Magic. My guest this week is none other than the Medley Mage himself, Chris Pakula. This is an interview that I've wanted to do for quite some time. Chris's reputation precedes him, so please enjoy this conversation. A quick note about the Humans of Magic Patreon. The Patreon can be found at patreon.com slash humansofmagic. This is where you can go and support what I do. If you become a patron or a Patreon member, you will have access to some perks, such as a exclusive Discord community, early access to all the episodes, the ability to do Q&A with me, and a bunch of other fun stuff. I think most importantly, the Patreon is just a way for me to keep this project going on a part-time basis. It is a labor of love. It is something that I do in my spare time, not a full-time gig, and every little bit of support will be much appreciated, would allow me to continue putting out more high-quality content in the future. Thanks for listening. Let's get to the episode. Chris Pakula, it's good to see you, man. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing well. I've uh yeah. I feel like I'm on a nice nice streak of doing well lately, and I'm still feeling like I'm doing well. Been pretty happy lately. So things are good. Oh, has it been going well with work, life, just just stuff in general? Uh, you know, last year I I was feeling sort of burnt out at my job for some. I don't really know why exactly. Uh, and I took a few months off, and since I've come back from that i've just kind of been happy about everything like it's just been going really well uh i don't know it was just one of those things where taking some time off maybe helped me figure out um what i want to do what i didn't want to do i don't know even though i, I purposely made the time off kind of dull which i know people think is odd but i was trying to uh i think i was trying to give myself an idea of what it would be like you know like if I were to quit my job because I was tired of it, you know, if you take three months off and all you do is like travel and go visit people, that's not like a realistic representation of what your life is necessarily going to be like. So I try to take it pretty, um, not over schedule it, just sort of, uh, make it what my life would normally be like if I just stopped working. Uh, and I really realized I just like working, not because I, Maybe like working is the wrong way to put it. Um, I really like being at work. I like being around a lot of like smart, interesting people. I'm I'm getting even more extroverted as I get older, I think. And uh, so the idea of like having a place I can go every day um, where a lot of people I like are forced to interact with me is fun. It's nice. So mm -hmm. so I've been mm -hmm. really enjoying work. Uh, yeah, you know, been been. I've been doing well lately. How about you? How are you? <laughs> I am doing pretty good overall. Uh, I just actually went for a long run today. Uh, this is it's your morning, but it's my evening. So right. I had a I, I had a I made a so I, I I'm based in Shanghai and I I was in Beijing for two days because to visit my team. Uh, I have a corporate job and I have some team members over there. Uh, came back today. Uh, I ran like there's a marathon that I'm doing in two weeks and. Um, I'm trying to make up for like a really shitty marathon performance that I did in my first marathon, which is a, a month ago. And I just, I'm just kind of that person where it's like, I feel I need to somehow make up for it. And so I went for a really long run today. I think it was like, um, about 20 miles. So, uh, I'm, I've, I've stretched and I think this is the last long run I'm going to do according to the literature. Like you're supposed to just, you're supposed to just like then take it easy for two weeks because it's, it's, I only have two weeks. So this is going to be mm -hmm. like, okay, I think I can do it. And, and that's it. But, um, yeah, I'm doing good overall. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. Um, I'm also going through some stuff with my job where it's like, sometimes I wonder, should I be there? But you know, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's how it is sometimes. So. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult to, uh, just be confident you're doing the right thing most of the time. I, I unless you get really lucky, mm -hmm. and then even if you get lucky and you're in the right thing, it's very easy to have a time period where uh, you just aren't sure. Um, yeah, I yeah. mean that's advice. So that's one thing. Um, I always tell people it's like it's just so dangerous to make big decisions when you're in a bad headspace. But but when you are, for for example, at your job, that's and if it's a job that takes up a lot of time or is stressful 
if your decision is, do I stay at this job? It's very hard to get, like, how are you going to get out of the headspace to make the right decision? And I was lucky enough where I was able to just take a few months off. And, you know, right before I did that, um, if you had told me that, you know, they were going to fire me, I'd have been like, I don't care. I don't even, I would think about quitting anyway. Mm -hmm. And, and, and six months later, I was like, oh my God, that would have been a disaster. And it's just crazy that my decision-making was just so warped by my state of mind. Like none of the yeah. facts had really changed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough to know. Uh, it's always tough to know what you should be doing when you're in the middle of it. And you can't even like really trust yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. It's tough. It's hard to get advice because um, at any given time, how many people really understand your life well enough to give you that, that level of advice. Um, right. Yeah. And also the way we represent ourselves and what, what we're going through to other people is just always um, skewed. Right. So it's like, even if I feel like I'm truthfully telling someone like a good friend, like what I'm going through, I haven't seen something maybe that they could see, or I haven't represented it in a way that would allow them to help me make a decision. So it's tricky. Yeah. I think I, as I get older, I think I've got better at that. Um, maybe I'm just more willing to tell people stuff that reflects poorly on me. Cause I just, I just don't worry about it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I'm better able to see other people's side of things. So when I'm telling someone about a third person, my, how I represent that person is more realistic now, maybe. Uh, yeah. So, so what was it during your sabbatical that gave you the clarity? Uh, so I've had a couple periods of time during my career where I wasn't working. Um, one of them was quite short. Uh, it was, I guess it was when I was 35 or so. So about 13 years ago. Um, and that was maybe six weeks, but I already knew what my next job was going to be. Um, and, uh, so that didn't really matter. I mean, it's six weeks is a lot. Like a lot of people never between ages, whatever, 22 and whatever may never have six weeks off of not of, of working. Um, that's less common now, I guess, because people switch jobs more and there's a lot more flexible jobs, but, um, you know, my dad's life he never had six weeks of no working basically between ages of like 22 and 60 or something um but still i that was nothing and then i had a year and a half off when i had quit a job and wasn't sure what i wanted to do next um but this last sabbatical uh yeah i just sort of realized that now that i was not now that competitive magic was just not as alluring because it just doesn't feel the same and i know that i, I mean i'm glad people are enjoying it and i know that some people are still able to get hyped about it. And I enjoyed watching a few of the tournaments recently. They, they were fun to watch and it felt kind of like magic of old at times. Uh, I just don't, um, yeah. So when I took the year and a half off, about half of that, I played magic hardcore. Um, that was when, uh, what was the uh, magic block with energy and Night Market Lookout, whatever that is. Oh, uh, uh, Kaladesh, Kaladesh or Aether right. so Revolt? Aether that Revolt, the... right. So that's yeah. when I I got deep into Aether Revolt uh, during that period of time. Um, and uh, I was just super into magic. But this last, like, five months, it was like, I knew that I wasn't going to get super into magic. Um, so I just didn't have anything. I, I've reached a point in my life where I, I think because I've been so sort of academic and competitive my whole life. And at now I'm just not interested in those things. Like when I tell, when I told people I was taking time off, I was like, well, I'm taking time off. I'm not, I'm honestly kind of trying to decide if I'm going to go back to work at all. People like, they get this idea of like, oh, what are you going to do? Do you have any projects you want to do? I'm like, no, I don't have any projects I'm going to do. They're like, well, is there stuff you want to learn? I'm like, not really. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's not what I, maybe that'll mm. change, but that is not the kind of person I am right now. So like, I want to like hang out with interesting people and, uh, go to metal shows and, uh, mm -hmm. turns out metal shows don't happen at like noon on a Tuesday. So, <laughs> no. so like whether or not I'm working has no effect. That's, that's the other right. thing. It's like, because so much of my, 
the things I want to do with my life now um, are not really impacted by work. Like I don't miss them because of work. Like, yeah, if I was like into golf or mm -hmm. had some passion that was going to take up six hours mm -hmm. of my day. There like isn't was, some huge uh, thing that takes like 40 hours of the week that. No. You, and yeah. so, so consequently, like, the job doesn't really interfere with the stuff I'm passionate about right now. If, if passionate's even the right word, I guess I am passionate about music. Um, uh, but yeah, I came to the realization that the job wasn't inter wasn't stopping me from doing anything I, that I really cared about doing at this point in my life. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, it's just, it's just I, I like being around people, so mm -hmm. it's hard to get people to hang out. You know, during the week, you call them and they're like, "I'm at work." Yeah, you know? and you bother your my wife for like on the eighth hour of bothering my wife. She's like, "Okay, can can you go find something right. to do right now?" Um, it's kind of like that phenomenon they say when like the the Japanese salary men they they retire and then now they're at home and then um, you know like what are they going to do right? So <laughs> yeah, so it's like it's weird because I'm, I I wouldn't describe it as being bored um, because it's just tough to be bored and well I mean the modern world I feel like it's tough to be bored since you can always like. Watch whatever you want to watch. Listen to whatever you want to listen to. Your friends are, some subset of your friends are online right now all the time. You, right. One of them might be playing Magic, and you can watch them even though they live in California or, 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 or London. Uh, so boredom is the wrong word. I was never bored at all, but it just felt like, um, because my job is just by every standard a great job, um, essentially, it just seemed dumb to not do it and i and i and, and then as soon as i went back i really have been enjoying it so i think there's also something to be said for you being good at a at your job right imagine Absolutely. you must be and, and you know being an options trader like you're bringing value and like people like there's a certain image that others have of you I'm not saying like it's it's totally ego driven but like you take pride in doing what you do i i would have to imagine so it's like to have not to not have that like that's that's kind of like I, maybe I'm projecting, but it's like, like for no. my, for my roles, I always think about that. Like, yeah, 60% of it is like, I'm bringing value. So, you know, you know, it's good. Yeah. For, for me, it's like, obviously like, um, being a trader is not, you know, I'm not, yeah, I guess the stereotypical thing people would say is I'm not curing cancer. Right. You know, I'm not, I, my job is not, it's not fulfilling in that, in that sense, like some jobs are, but mm. like, but it's intellectually is, fulfilling or other so ways, So my job right? is, right. My job, my job is like very similar to, you know, you and your friends trying to like get better at magic together or you and your friends like being, you know, I have friends who gamble on sports for a living and my job is somewhat similar to that. There's actually a lot of magic players, obviously, in the sports gambling industry. Um, mm. It is like trying to solve a hard problem with a bunch of other smart people and especially because I was um, pretty, I was deeply involved with who we hired for, for the team I work with now that um, they're generally people I really like. Uh, and I really like mentoring people and I really, and it's, you know, although it is very much, you know, a, like I said, it's a, it's a pure, purely uh, capitalist job and not, not, uh, fulfilling in every possible way like it is I do think it's like a great career for a lot of people and helping young people get going in that career uh, has been really fun for me um, yeah it, it is a very fulfilling job and it is fun being good at it um, and I think a lot of right a lot of people don't get it because a lot of people's jobs just kind of aren't great lock and, in or yeah yeah um, and I'm very lucky that I have a job that I'm able to like, mm -hmm. um, enjoy and get paid well. And it's, it's mm -hmm. been cool. So, yeah. And, and I've had periods of time where I got burnt out in the past, but I'm, I'm just not there right now. Right now I'm just super into it and enjoying it. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, it's basically like, I guess I learned that I, I would be fine not working, but I'm just, there's no reason not to. And it's, and I'm clearly happier doing it right now. Have so, you been but in it the does same? Hurt, it does kill my magic career though. Like, um, because, so I, I guess I should just mention this briefly, like when I switched to this job, I guess six, six ish years ago, um, my family and I, li we lived in Pennsylvania, this job's in New York. So we came to the agreement that 
I would just kind of live in both places at the start. I would live in New York during the week, come back to Pennsylvania on weekends because we weren't sure the job was going to work out and uprooting the, I have a, you know, I'm married um, and we have one child and my son who's, who's almost 18 now. So we're almost uh, mm -hmm. empty nesters as they say, but you know, we didn't want to uproot him, figure out where we we're going to move in New York and then get here and be like, Oh, this job sucks. I don't even want it. But it turns out we just decided to just keep doing this. So I've been living apart for most of the last six years. I only see my family two or three days a week. And those days mm -hmm. are Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I mean, that's when magic tournaments are, right? So I can't... So this has sort of killed my ability to play competitive magic. Um, which has been fine. I haven't really... You know, I don't really regret that at all. But uh, that is part of the reason why I haven't even tried to really even dabble in the new competitive magic scene is, is that like, I'm not, I'm just not going to, yeah, I only see them two days a week. Like to, to burn mm -hmm. one of those days for a magic tournament seems a little rough. Mm -hmm. Have you guys talked about, uh, just relocating, <laughs> relocating everybody to, to where you are or? Well, in a year, my son is going less than off a year to college. Now. Right. right. Yeah, in a year he'll be off to college. So then my wife, Carrie is just going to move to New York and we are going to mostly live in New York full time. So, Oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's very considerate of you. I, I guess as your son was a teenager, it made sense not to just displace schools and his, his yeah. friends and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He would have hated it. And, uh, yeah. And to be honest, like my, at, at the beginning, you know, I've been married for since 2001. Um, and I've basically been, you know, dating my wife since, 1996 or 1997, 1996. So, uh, honestly, at first only seeing each other two, two days a week was like kind of exciting. Be like, Whoa, this is uh, like, I get home on Friday and I was like, wow, I haven't seen you in so long. This is great. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for, even from, for, for, uh, our relationship, the, the separation has not really felt like a negative at all. Um, there have been two long periods during these six years um, where I was at home. One was during COVID when everyone was kind of working from home. So I had a long period at home then. And then, of course, I had the sabbatical. So that was nice to have two periods of time of being home interspersed. And the year and a half before I started the job, I wasn't working, so I was just home all the time. Um, so as my son has got older, uh, I will say it's made parenting a little tricky because uh, – he was a very easy child to parent for most of his life and a very, he was very, he was very easy to hang out with, like spend time with. Like when, when he was 13 and 14 and I came home on the weekends, he would be excited to spend time with me and it would, and, and it was easy now that he's like seven, 16, 17. Um, yeah, it's a bit different. One, one, he's a little harder to parent at times and I'm, and me being gone is putting that burden on Carrie. Uh, but also he's just harder to spend time with. Like I'll get home and I'll be like, Hey, do you want to watch some anime? And he's like, no, I'm going out with my friends. Like, Oh, well, all right, that's fine. Um, so, so that the parenting part has got a little tricky, uh, but overall living apart has, uh, while, while hurting the magic career completely, um, basically taking that to zero overall, it's been way more successful than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I mean, in this uh, theoretical counterfactual universe where you don't have those issues, like the family's all together, or you don't have scheduling issues, is the magic fire still still there? Um, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. Um, I guess you got to try to know. So yeah, I, I or just to know, maybe. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's a, a definitely a no. Um, you know, I've had. I always feel like I, I, I think about magic slightly differently than other people. Um, I'm not very nostalgic, um, except about very specific things. Uh, so like I don't play old school, I don't play pre-modern, that stuff doesn't really interest me. I've had periods of time where I have done things in magic that I feel like a lot of my older magic friends would never do, like go to tournaments where you don't know anybody. And just, you know, I was going, like, I would go to, occasionally go to, when I first started going to Star City events, 
Um, yeah, I was going to say, I saw you playing like Canadian Thresh on uh, Star yeah, City. When I, so when I first started going to Star City events, I didn't really know anybody because none of my like kind of like old Magic Pro friends went. And it was a totally new crowd. Um, but I just liked playing Magic. I used to go to, there was a period of time when I first moved to Pennsylvania where like uh, there were a lot of like vintage tournaments on the East Coast that allowed proxies. And that was when I had taken a long break from competitive magic. Like, so my son was born in 2006. And I think there's like, I want to say there's two calendar years where I played zero sanctioned magic tournaments. I, that's, there's might be more now, but at that point, so I think I played zero in 2006. And maybe zero, what was the other year? It doesn't matter. But anyway, I wasn't, yeah. I, I actually completely so very... stopped. Very, very small gaps, actually, oh, yeah, like so, over a twenty, over two decades, basically. Yeah, there weren't a lot, um, but there was one period of time where I like completely stopped playing competitive Magic. But then I just started going to these like vintage tournaments, where once again I didn't really know anybody, uh, mm -hmm. but I would just like meet new people. Um, I made some great friends through those tournaments, um, and occasionally random people would show up. I like, I think I beat Gerard Fabiano in the finals for a Black Lotus in one of them. Uh, or maybe there's a semifinals. I don't remember. But so people would occasionally show up. But I guess the point is like, I, I have at times had the fire to just play random stuff, even though the stakes were low and it wasn't like, you know, a lot of people get back into it now. Maybe they, they go because they're like, well, I'll hang out with my friends all weekend, worst case scenario. But I was like going to stuff where like, my friends aren't even there. Um, just purely because, uh, I do still just sometimes get that fire. You, you know, I, I've, I I tell people sometimes the thing that gets me, um, the that gets me the most like magic FOMO is every now and then someone will win both Magic Online challenges in a single weekend. Like they'll win like the Legacy Challenge on Saturday and the Legacy Challenge on Sunday, and I will be so envious of how they must feel. I am like that must be the greatest feeling in the world. Like, I want to feel that so badly. And I've actually played very few um, Magic Online tournaments over the years. I don't know why. Like, I know there's, you know, Tommy Ashton has won like 100 Magic Online qualifiers. So some, some, that's not 100, I'm sure. But Yeah, I was going to ask you if you played Magic Online because so it's I, pretty so convenient. I did used to, so I've been playing a ton of Magic Online, but for whatever reason, I've actually played very few real tournaments on Magic Online. Like, I, I think I've oh, probably I played... I've probably played fewer than 20 challenges. I've probably played fewer uh, than 20, fewer that's than probably 20, because of scheduling, right? Because it's hard yeah. to put all that. It's a huge amount of time commitment on a weekend, basically. Right. So, um, yeah. So for some reason, I never played that many big tournaments. Um, so it doesn't even make sense. Like, it's not like I'm. Uh, I tried to ever win two challenges in a weekend. I've never played two challenges in a weekend. But yeah. Man, it gets me so excited. Like I'm. I was like, man, that has to feel amazing. So I yeah. do definitely have a, a part of me that loves the, still loves the idea of the magic grinder lifestyle, but I just don't, it's just not yeah. possible to fit into my life. Um, yeah. To commit to that is hard. Yeah. So, and then of course, like I, I also find the new magic pro circuit since co very confusing. I never really know what tournaments are what. So like when you ask me what I get back into it, I'm like, I guess if someone would explain it, to me or maybe if i was if, if i had if i thought there was a real chance i'd play i'd learn it but i'm always so confused by what by what tournaments quality <laughs> qualify you for what and i just assumed that folks like you would just have a perfect idea because like i imagine like back then back in the day it was probably even more convoluted or something no whatever. it was way simpler back in the day really it was, it was right um yeah it was definitely much easier back in the day there were ptqs and there were grand prix and that was mm -hmm. kind of it Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there were the points things, um, there have been times where there's been random other stuff, but I don't think that mattered yeah. in terms of like qualifying. It was just, it used to be more obvious which tournaments you should play. I very uh, much, okay. I yeah. very much, um, I think this is partly rated, partly related to, uh, the job I have and the fact that I played like so much poker over the years. Um, I definitely get into like a decision fatigue type mode sometimes for like when I leave work I, I please don't make ask me to make another decision today like I, I don't right. want to do it you've used all so, of your decision making energy that day so like so, so I don't know did, did you ever play like the RPTQ system uh 
that that was like what they had what like this is before the MPL, right? Like basically yeah, like the, it was like I wanna say it was like twenty I twenty fifteen. No, I, I basically just played GPs because I enjoy certain formats right. like Legacy, so, but it was just GPs for me. So Grand Prix, yeah. I love Grand Prix. Just so fun. Really love Grand Prix. So when when they got rid of the PTQ system and they instituted like where you you would like have to win a PPTQ and then that would qualify you for the RPTQ. Mm -hmm. Those RPTQs killed me because you know you could go to the one near you, but when you lived on the East Coast you knew that there were going to be a bunch of good players there and they were literally going to be larger and there wouldn't be an extra slot. The way the extra slots worked was like there were buckets. So you probably wouldn't get enough people to get to the next bucket. So, so you would have to like, say, am I going to travel for the RPTQ? And I just found that so stressful where I would have to like, so for, I flew to RPTQs twice to, to, essentially to try to play in small RPTQs because that was like the optimal thing. But I just did not enjoy, I want everyone to know where they're supposed to go and play. I, I really didn't enjoy the choice of like, where am I going to fly? I don't find those little sub games interesting. Uh, I went to some Grand Prix that had PTQs on day two. And there were, I forget the exact situations, but there were situations where it was like, wasn't clear if you were better off continuing in the Grand Prix or playing in the PTQ. And I'm like, I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to decide this. Like, I don't want to make this choice. Like, it's just, yeah. I, I found, I found stuff like that. Um, to be honest, I don't even like choosing what deck I play. I know that that's very like, <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. that's yeah. a real, um, some people don't get that at all. Like I, I would much rather have someone tell me what deck to play. I don't, I don't find that part of magic that interesting anymore. Um, mm -hmm. If I had time to like build decks and tweak, maybe I would, but uh, yeah, I just don't like choices for some reason when it comes to this stuff. Um, I just mm -hmm. want to like get right to it. So some of that stuff that I think wouldn't bother other people did make it slightly less enjoyable for me because I'm a weirdo, I guess. But but Do I you still have think... any. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I say I still think there's a chance I could I could get into competitive magic again if the situ if if the conditions were all right like mm -hmm. um and i have considered going to some of the recent events even though i don't really know how they work or what i would play there uh yeah um but i just haven't seen people in a while it's been a while now since i went to an event and saw a lot of people um i i didn't even go to the pro tour in philadelphia even though i live in philadelphia um or whatever it's called, but, uh, but that was partly bad luck because I had accidentally planned some things that weekend that I couldn't cancel. Uh, but still, I could have gone. Um, yeah, so even though I've made many choices and, and shown a real lack of attempt to educate myself about it the past few years, I still think I could, in theory, fall back into it, at least temporarily. What do you think is your... Um... What what sorts of competitive magic unfinished business do you feel you have? Is it just to win a PT, or is it like like what what it, if if you were to hypothetically get back into it, what would really drive you? Uh just competing maybe because it sounds like you yeah, play you I, love magic for the the love of the game kind of stuff. So I all right, all right now we're gonna get into the the weird stuff. Um, yeah, so I think one of the weird things about me and magic is that. Obviously, very famously, not in the Hall of Fame. And I fully admit that, um, although I think it would have been reasonable for me to have been voted into the Hall of Fame early on, um, it is now very clear many years later uh, that most of the people in the Hall of Fame are significantly better than me at Magic. Like, I do not deserve to be mentioned as being in the same tier of player as at least half the Hall of Fame. They're just clearly way better than I ever was. Um, but, but what makes it weird is that I still sort of um, enjoy a lot of the like psychological benefits of, of kind of as if I was. A lot of people just think I'm in the Hall of Fame. Uh, magic players are almost universally incredibly nice to me. Um, I have random people at tournaments come up and say super nice things to me. I've had people at metal shows come up and say super nice things to me. I have people online, like just 
you know, I get a lot of attention and it's all very positive. Um, mm -hmm. And because of that, doing like winning a pro tour wouldn't like change like how I interact with people. I know this sounds, maybe this sounds weird. I don't know, but I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm already treated in a way as if I'd done things I haven't done, if that makes sense. Um, so I don't know. And, and because of that, uh, I have to do something so like, I literally have to like win a pro tour to change anything. And that's like not going to happen. Like even if I got super into magic and became one of like the 10 best players in the world, I still might never win a pro tour. Right. So it's like the bar for what would meaningfully change my status in the magic community is crazy high. Like I, um, yeah, top eight in a pro tour wouldn't change anything about what anybody thinks about me. Um, so in that sense, it's like, it's hard to have goals. And I think this was somewhat demotivating for me at times mm -hmm. um, because I felt like, right, if I don't, it, it would be easy to look at it as like, everything is kind of pointless unless you win a pro tour, but I, that's not really, I just like doing well. Like I, you know, I, I if I go, so people, this is a very common thing people say, where like, if, let's say there's a one slot PTQ, people like to say that like the worst possible result is second, right? Have you ever heard someone say that? Or like, sure. It's to... like the silver medal in the Olympics is not the gold medal or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That like you basically spent as much time as you could and didn't get there. Like you'd been better off going 0 and 5 or 0 and 4 and dropping or whatever. And I do not feel that way at all. Like I would love to get second in a one spot PTQ. Mm -hmm. I would just love to have a good tournament. Um, so the process matters, not just strictly the results, right? Like uh, the... But second is a good result. So I think results do matter. Like, I, I think that's the thing. It's a, I don't, and that's not because like, you know, I don't have the fire to win or whatever. It's just that I don't, I understand that um, there's a lot of variance and maybe because I don't have specific goals. Like maybe if my goal was to qualify for the pro tour mentally, I would feel that way, but when I go to Magic Tournament, my goal is to like have fun playing Magic that day, I guess, or just do well um, and have good matches. And like when people ask me like highlights of my Magic career, like the things I think about that make me the happiest are not from are not even from tournaments where like I did well uh, necessarily. Um, like my most recent thing. Um, the last, like if people ask me what recently, what, what recent magic thing you feel really good about or got you excited, uh, in the, one of the last like arena style, like, uh, like esports style pro tours they gave me an invite to, um, I don't even, I guess it was standard with, uh, fires, whatever the four mana enchantment is where you can cast stuff for free. Uh, what's that card called? Fires of Invention? Is that what it's called? Fires of Invention, yes. Yeah, so I went to that uh, eSports Pro Tour thing in California, um, and I beat Alexander Hain in that tournament. And that is really what I think about all the time, because I just think he is amazing. He is the coolest guy, and he's so good at magic. And I was so stress during that match even though like i don't even know what my record was at the time i mean i think we were it was early so we were all still on but like it had nothing to do with like winning that tournament or uh or what prizes were or anything i just wanted to play just beating him in a match that i know he wanted to win um so yeah i just like playing uh I just I do still just like playing magic, and I, maybe that's why it's weirdly maybe that's why I don't get back involved in tournament magic because I'm able to like make myself get so involved in random magic. It's so like the only magic I've been playing the past like two years, three years, really is uh, during COVID we started a Discord server that's all magic players that listen to metal, um, mm. but we refer to ourselves as dirt wizards, 
And uh, we started doing all these weird format drafts, uh, mostly roto drafts. And I get so competitive during these matches um, that it's ridiculous. When I play against Brian Brown Doohan, who's much better than me at Magic, I get so stressed, it you would think I was in a Pro Tour. Like, I just get really stressed out. Like, I really want to win these matches so badly. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I'm just able to get so... I'm Yeah, I'm able to get a you're, lot you're, you're out of it. You're getting your competitive juices fulfilled, like, through these things. So yeah, you don't, so I don't necessarily need, like, some sort of Wizards-created system really because right. like but, in that moment you're playing uh brian brown doing like you're playing f in your mind you're playing for stakes and it matters and you want to do well so right and 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 that's partly i think because i already like reap the benefits of having done well in the wizard system like i i, I already have that yeah so 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 i don't feel you extracted I don't, that already yeah right yeah. i don't i don't need to you're win proving yourself I don't I need guess. to win in a way that gives me status in the magic community. I just need to win for me. I, I guess mm -hmm. if, that, if that makes sense. I don't know. It I, makes I, sense. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's a very long winded. I'm, I'm, I give a lot of long winded answers. So I hope no, no, it's that. cool. It's cool, man. Yeah. Um, you know, I, <laughs> this is not me. I, I swear. Somebody, one of the folks that I asked to get background about you said an interview with Chris would be a miss without asking him about the Hall of Fame. So I have to ask you about the Hall of Fame. This is my this is my excuse to ask you about it. Like, is yeah. it still a sore spot for you? Or are you over it? Or like, how do you feel about that? Um. Uh, I, I think I'm over it because in many ways the damage has been done. Like, well, first of all, it's not even clear that the Magic Hall of Fame even is a thing anymore. Like, they've... They aren't putting new people yeah, in. It's kind of weird now. Yeah, I, it's so obviously old. that has soured it. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing that used to drive me—I mean, it's just the fact that if I had just got into the Hall of Fame the first time I came close, or the first time if I had inflamed correctly and got in that next year. I just would have got to play in so many pro tours. Like I missed the whole era really of like people getting a testing house and um, hanging out for a week before the tournament. And, uh, and it's a lot. I mean, I could have played in like 60 more pro tours or something crazy or, or 40, you know, I don't know, really a lot of, a lot of, so that just would have been a lot of tournaments hang out with my friends at a time in my life where I would have really enjoyed that. Um, and I can't get, if they put me in the Hall of Fame tomorrow, I, I don't get that back. Right. So, right. That's true. It's past. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, it doesn't matter. And, um, yeah, I think I am kind of over it. Uh, I do. I do think I got unlucky in a in a bunch of random ways, um, and I uh, I definitely had some like burnout associated with it. I think I did worse at Magic because of it. For there was a two year period where I was not in a great mental state about it. I would say like especially the year where I was like, I don't know if you how closely you followed this, but there was. Um, well, essentially, they changed the Pro Tour system over time, the Pro Point system. So if you had the same results in the Pro Tour in the late 2000s versus your results in the Pro Tour in the like late 90s, early 2000s, you would just have more Pro Points in the late 2000s just because they slightly changed how the system worked. So because I played mostly under the old system, they were going to up the threshold to be eligible for the ballot. So I, I was going to become ineligible to be on the Hall of Fame ballot because even though if I had, obviously, if, if my results were from 2007, I, I would still be on it. So there was a year where I had to start playing again to stay on the ballot. Um, that year was not good for me mentally because I was basically forcing myself to go to tournaments that I 
wasn't excited about. Uh, and going to tournaments when maybe like it wasn't a great scheduling thing with my family. Um, yeah, there was a real bad Hall of Fame period where uh, it got talked about a ton online. Um, uh, I had a situation where like like a magic player I was friends with, I like tried to help him get a job. And then like two months later, he wrote an article about why I shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. That was kind of weird. Uh, I'm sure he was saying he was just that's just being rational and that was his opinion, but it didn't feel great. Um, mm -hmm. But it hit a point where I feel like if I hadn't tried to get back on the ballot, people would have been like disappointed in me, and that put a lot of weird pressure. I put a lot of weird pressure on myself, where where magic started to feel more like a responsibility than something I felt yeah. like doing because, yeah, I don't know. I got in a weird head state there for a while. I'm not in yeah, that that's anymore. Yeah, that's a weird out-of-body experience kind right. of thing. And, yeah. and, and in, so over there was like a two- or three-year period where I could point to a handful of tournaments where I just sort of like reached a breaking point and kind of like, you know, just should have had a good tournament and didn't because my mental state around all that stuff just got bad. Uh yeah, it was just too much. It was just it was just too much Hall of Fame discourse. Too much people. Yeah, I mean, when you have like fifty people come up to you at a tournament and be like, "Oh, I hope you get back on the ballot. You should be in there. It's a travesty." Yeah, you don't want to tell them, "Oh, I'm not even trying to get back on the ballot." Like it, it just feels. I, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or maybe I was people... just like. Campaigning for you, writing articles about you. I know you said there's some people who wrote against you, but I've read lots that were for you. It was it's yeah. just like election season. Oh, so. there's like a right, there's like a big Reddit thread from a long time ago about me not being in the Hall of Fame. Um, and people still send it to me. I had a coworker like three months ago out of nowhere be like, Hey man, I read this old Reddit thread about you and I was just like Yeah. Like <laughs> Like I had, I had Have you seen this thing? I had like a, I had a different coworker be like, I've never seen so many positive things said about anyone ever. Like it's just like, and I'm like, yeah. I... So yeah, I was like, how do you respond to that? <laughs> and yeah, it's all very nice, but it did like, I did reach a point where it felt like I was trying to get back on the ballot for like other people, even though I, yeah. I didn't want to be in the Hall of Fame. I, I did obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and then like, yeah. And the, and the way, like, you know, I, I basically missed by one vote one time and then I kind of missed by one vote another time. And then mm -hmm. there was the year where I would have got in if they'd used the previous year's rules, but they changed the rules. So I missed, like, it was just, there's been a lot of like also mm -hmm. random stuff. So it was like very, it was stressful. Uh, yeah. a lot of it maybe happened during a period of my life where I wasn't, um, as happy all the time too. So maybe that, or, or maybe it was making me unhappy. I don't know. I feel like I would handle it better now. Um, but, uh, I definitely did worse at magic for a period of time for like, I, th I think was definitely had some psychological reasons mm -hmm. with it. And part of it was all just like this weird pressure I put on myself that, that yeah. I, I don't think I would do now. I still, I still sometimes feel, um, Like it is very uneven payoff. Like me doing poorly at a tournament feels worse than me doing kind of well at a tournament. Like, like I have to like, like if I do horrible at a tournament and everyone knows it, like I have like to, to offset that, I literally have to win the tournament. I can't like just have a good tournament. Um, mm. still feels that like that a little bit sometimes, which I think is, yeah. um, I mean, that's a pretty common thing in gambling where losses feel worse than wins. That's just a surreal experience. Like to have that kind of, uh, sorry, I know, I know this is like, people have asked you this before, but like just to have this kind of magic celebrity, like I, on it, like that's just really, that's tough. Right. I mean, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, it, it's, uh, well, I mean, as you said, it's mostly good compliments from people, but, but there's still uh, this kind of like thing where, you know, people think of Chris Pakula and that's divorced from like who you are as an actual person. 
You know? uh, well, interestingly, a lot of my magic celebrity is is more for me as a person than my results. So in that sense, um, that, that, okay, fair, fair. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. in that sense, yeah. that's that's okay. Uh, you know, yeah. a lot of people. In terms of you your know, interests and what you, right. well, what people you used like to, love, to do. You know, I, I used to do like pro tour commentary and, and people used to yeah. love that. And then, you know, people, a lot of people uh, love the fact that I was anti-cheating and helped with that. Like, so a lot of the treatment I get in the magic community is actually about me as a person, not just because I won a bunch of tournaments, because I did not. I did not win a bunch of tournaments. Um so uh yeah it's complicated uh okay, as, well, as in many, that case it's mostly good <laughs> uh, anytime that you get yourself kind of like uh mentally tied up in weird ways it's going to be complicated i guess and 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 maybe not make sense sound like it makes sense after the fact uh but yeah uh the hall of fame stuff definitely messed me up for a while but it definitely just mostly messed me up within magic it wasn't like i was at home with my family and friends depressed about not being in the hall of fame it wasn't yeah. that but it was like when i'm going to magic tournaments messing me up for sure but yeah that wasn't yeah, that yeah. long of a period of time but it was happening right yeah. right and yeah i mean as you said at the very beginning of this conversation like you're in a much better space right now so it's you know that hopefully this is all kind of like stuff that you processed and it's in the past so yeah yeah um i want to talk about the 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 meddling mage card like so my that that photo i showed you where it was i think it was your autograph on meddling mage and i think it was done at the uh is it the plane shift pre-release because that's when the right. card card came out so I, I guess i'll i guess for the video podcast i'll just put a photo up there but it was actually a friend who traded somebody for that card he wasn't at the pre-release but it's it's it he told he tells me it's his most value possession now um all right why, why did you um number the signatures like were you trying to make it like a limited edition kind of thing yeah or... so, so i went to the i went to the plane shift pre-release um at neutral ground in new york and at the time that was like the, kind of like the premier magic store, you know, it was sure. like, uh, the kind of like the cool place to play magic. And somebody opened a medley mage and asked me to sign it. And I just had the idea of like, Oh, what if I just number all the ones that I actually signed at the pre-release? So yeah, I don't remember how many there are, but all the ones that were actually opened at the neutral realm pre-release that I, that I signed are numbered and dated. So that's what right. those are. Those are actually from that day. Okay, and then every every car every mage you sign after that, it's just your signature. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I've written something weird on a couple of them, um, but no, it's just mostly just my terrible signature. My signature's always been bad, uh, and I think many people, when they started to get asked to sign cards, would work on making their signature better, but I I just never did. <laughs> so I apologize to all the people who have signed Chris Pacula cards. Was it something that, that you needed to work on? You felt it's like a really, you needed to work it's on. not a great signature. Uh, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, it has changed yeah. slightly over the years. Uh, I probably should have just worked on a, a better one, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, no, mm -hmm. now I usually just sign them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the most interesting situation in which you've been asked to sign a meddling mage? Uh, hmm. Well, I did just get, I just got asked to sign a card while at a metal show for the first time. Um, although that wasn't, it wasn't really like unexpected. It was like, I was talking on, I was talking on Twitter about going to a show with someone in London and mm. then that person had a friend from Australia who saw the Twitter conversation, asked them if I could sign a meddling mage. So he just brought it with him to the show. So it wasn't like a random person, uh, but yeah. it was still kind of cool that at a show I was signing a card for someone who lived in Australia when Wait, I was in London. Your friend in London was that Callum Smith? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I met Callum uh, in in London before because uh, because we're in a legacy circle. Right. So yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Someone. So yeah, Someone so mentioned Callum, that you guys were friends. So, so Callum yeah. brought a meddling mage to the show, and I signed it. So I'd never signed a meddling mage at a show before. I don't think. Uh, I don't know if I have a great okay. sign of meddling mage story. I mean, I've definitely, crazy. I've definitely yeah. had people ask me to sign them like after they had 
beat me in a tournament and something had happened where I was like kind of annoyed where like either it was like I don't remember the details now but this has happened a handful of times where either like it was an important match or like one of those matches where you lose but like your your opponent like didn't really even know how their cards worked and you had to keep correcting things and like but you just lost or maybe there's like a judge ruling you didn't agree with or just something I've definitely had the match end where you're like not you didn't have a good time you're not feeling good and they bust out the medley mages and you're just like all right I'll sign your medley mages like I could could you give him could you could have found me after the next round but that's fine uh but uh no I don't think I have uh hmm. maybe I'll think of one later I can't think of a story now no Sorry. I mean magic players are generally not great at reading the room from just speaking from personal experience oh so. that is, right that is true yeah yeah that's fair. yeah 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 Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, let's 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 just get right into it. I want to talk about um, the the early days, and now I feel bad broaching this question because you just told me that you're not a very nostalgic kind of person. But I I, <laughs> I have to ask about this because um, I, I I really am interested. Like like, can you tell me how Team Dead Guy was formed? Sure. Uh, so it's basically a group of us who played. So when I went to I went to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, uh, and I was a freshman in 1993. When I went home for summer break in 1994, 1994, that's when I was introduced to Magic. Because uh, a friend of mine had, I think he got shown it at, at a LARP or something. I was like, I didn't know you LARPed, but uh, so we started playing Magic that summer. When I went back to Cornell. Uh, Cornell has a, I, they probably still have it. Every Friday night was a gaming club, but Cornell is huge. Um, when I went back, found the Magic players. Uh, and then, you know, became friends with a handful of people. Um, uh, we started uh, going to events in New York that were run by Brian David Marshall and, um, and Glenn Friedman, who would go on to make Neutral Ground. Uh, and we went to, there were all the smaller tournaments around Ithaca. So we started going to events together. Um, uh, events in Syracuse that uh, were run by Chetty Hampson, who then founded uh, TCG Player. Uh, but there's an old, there's a 90s uh, kind of like hardcore noise rock band called Dead Guy uh, that we were really into. Um, they actually played a show um, in our dorm at Cornell once because um, there's a pretty big like in the dorm okay yeah so at Cornell had a pretty big like hardcore punk community uh, and some people who had like grown up like putting on shows in high school on Long Island and uh, so they just kept doing it so like we had basically like I had friends who kind of like um, would try to promote shows like at Cornell or in Ithaca so they they got dead guy to come out um, and uh, and there was a big there was a venue called uh, the Lost Horizon in Syracuse that had a lot of shows. So sometimes fans would play in Ithaca and then go play there the next night. Uh, but anyway, we we wore our Dead Guy T-shirts all the time, and uh, the people at Neutral Ground just started calling us those Dead Guys because they didn't even know what Dead Guy was. They just saw the shirts, so they would. No. Um, so that that's how we became Team Dead Guy. Uh, um. Which is really oh, funny. Oh, that's now. interesting. Yeah, I which, thought it had something to do with that beverage. Like no, there was some... that was so that was way later. So and so... Then the beverage is named after the band, presumably, or no relation. No, no relation. So the right, no relation. I'm the, so the... glad I asked you because this is going to yeah. set the record straight. Yeah, it's very confusing. Yeah. So yeah, so we're Team Dead Guy, kind of named after a band, but not on. We didn't really come up with the name, but then it was like because was you're cool. just wearing the shirts, and then people just, just the named you. Yeah, kind very of organic. essentially, and then that deck. The Rogue Dead Guy Ale deck from Grand Prix Philadelphia 2006, maybe, is what it was. Um, that is because uh, I just built that deck on my own before the tournament, and I had never played a game with it, uh, but someone else played it at Neutral Ground. People were practicing for the tournament, and I was like, look, I can't come, but someone should play this, see what they think. Um, but People, someone was just like, oh, cool, it's just playing a brew. And because we were a Team Dead Guy, and I knew there was a beer called uh, Dead Guy, okay. I just called it yeah. that. 
Uh, yeah, it's yeah. been very confusing over the years. You get a lot of people who don't understand all this, and why would you? Uh, it's quite bizarre. Okay. And, and and to further make things weird, uh, two years ago, three, the band Dead Guy has reunited and is now playing shows again, um, which oh, is also sweet. which is also funny. Uh, yeah, and then I, I just, I just, uh, there's a band I listened to, uh, called Intercourse, maybe not the most convenient band name, uh, but I, I, uh, started talking to their guitar player online, and his name is Sean, and he, he's actually a Magic player, went to see him, was talking to him at a show, he's like, uh, he's like, man, you're not gonna believe this, like, I just watched this old Magic video, and I'm, you know, and somebody's playing mono red and and they were wearing a dead guy shirt and i was like and i was i happened to be wearing a dead guy shirt at the time i was like yeah that, that guy was the best man at my wedding like <laughs> yeah so was that, was that david price that was or? david price yeah okay. so um yeah so there's a lot of weird dead guy confusion and connections but so who was um, the who was the original what was the original <laughs> dead guy crew it was david price and so the only ones you'll probably know are me and david price um it was me david price uh David Bartlow, right? David Bartlow. Uh, uh, Tony Sai was Tony Sai, who, by the way, he is he goes under the radar. He's not really on social media. He doesn't go to live events. He's been, you know, when people show the like uh, seventeen lands best arena players. Um, okay. People have been posting that. I've seen him. He's been showing up in those. So I know he is still. He he is still, still playing, playing magic. He's still playing okay. magic, doing well. He is very. Uh, secretly an extremely good limited player. Um, and okay. I don't even know if people know that's that's who it is. But, like, yeah, somebody posted it recently, and I texted him. I was like, I see you on here. I see what you're doing. <laughs> uh, and uh, and actually this guy named Bob Klein, who was just another guy we went to uh, mm -hmm. Cornell with. And then I don't know how. Maybe we met on Usenet or something, but – at Pro Tour 3 in Columbus, which uh, was the Ice Age Alliance's Pro Tour. Um, I believe that's where we met Worth, and then we really hit it off with Worth Wolpert, and then Worth Wolpert kind of joined our team as well. Right. So, so I think that was the full team dead guy. Um, and he didn't go to Cornell. He went to, uh, he went to Penn, State. Penn State. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. So that that became Team Team Dead Guy. And yep. uh, okay, okay. Did did people have different roles on the team? Like, was there one person that was known for X and another person for Y? Or, uh, or... no, not really. I mean, things were a lot looser back then. So. Um... It's not a. It's not like a magic team as we know it now, right? It's just guys playing magic together. Kind of, yeah. I mean, it was different because I mean, magic was just so different back then. Like, uh, everything was just so much less solved. You know, there's no magic online. The time period you had to actually prepare for things, I, I believe, was shorter. Um, mm -hmm. Like in terms of like new set comes out and pro tour. Um, you could actually break eh, the format. It you was, know? You it could. was right. You could, but yeah, you could. We we were not particularly good at that. Um, we uh, it was hard to get people. It, was, it wasn't always easy to get um, to play limited. Um, just had to get a lot of people. Uh, although draft didn't really, yeah, it was hard to get drafts going. Um, we would often have to go to Syracuse and draft with the children. Um, Wait, what do you mean by that? Just like younger uh -oh. kids playing magic? Yeah, like like uh, Jamie Park, who uh, another options trader who, um, oh, got, younger got, than you guys. He got okay. second in worlds one year, so I've known him since he was like fourteen or something. Because yeah. when we go when we go to Syracuse, uh, Brian Manalakis, who's big in like the old school community, he has a podcast. Mm -hmm. They they were basically like freshmen in high school or something when we started going uh, oh. to Syracuse to play. Like, yeah. um, so I've known all of them. So yeah, so we would often go, uh, we would have to go f play with them to get people who were serious about like drafting, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, no, we didn't really have roles. I mean, Dave was, we had, we certainly had, uh, things that different ones of us, like Dave was a very much the aggro player always. Um, 
not always, but uh, we certainly had people, we had tendencies, um, but we weren't, um, yeah, I don't know. We did try to do the big, like, serious team for one tournament, and we did terrible. Like, we got together with Team CMU, which is, like, Randy Bueller and Eric Lauer, mm. uh, Mike Turian. Yeah, and that was really a bust, um, and I don't remember why. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, no, yeah. definitely didn't have particular roles. We just kind of played Magic. Yeah. I remember there was a summer where me and Dave Barthlow... We just played, like, this is very early, obviously, like maybe summer 95, summer 96, summer, I don't know. We just played Necro mirror matches all, like, for hours every day. <laughs> yeah, that was, like, the, that, was the, that was the deck back then. I remember that. Just, like, trying to, like, figure out the exact, what we thought was the exact right configuration. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they, our early Magic, it, it is hard to have played Magic back then. And not have so much of your association of like that era of magic be with the card Necropotence. Because it was yeah. just like, it was a real separator for like. It's the Necro decade, yeah. Who actually understood magic and who didn't. And there's a lot of funny mm -hmm. Necro stories. And I just, yeah, really just, you know, uh, I guess my first constructed top eight was with Necro, right? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we played a lot of Necropotence. Yeah, it made a lot of magic players. It put a it lot really, of people on the map. It really yeah. did. Because yeah. it was just the best deck. So if you were pretty, it's you had to a, play it, right? It's not a reasonable, I mean, by modern standards, maybe it's not that crazy. But back then, it was not a reasonable magic card. Yeah, just didn't, mm -hmm. it didn't make a lot of sense. Right, so. right. But you were the kind of the de facto, is it fair to say, kind of a leader of Team Dead Guy? Uh, or maybe just the most outspoken or the most vocal in some ways? Um. I was probably given a bigger, I was given more coverage. Well, they, when they, when they started asking me to do uh, commentary, I think that gave, um, you kind of became the front man. Yeah, I did. And I was very like, uh, outgoing and, um, less moody than Dave. Dave was pretty moody. <laughs> so maybe wasn't always, he wasn't always, as... which, which, which Dave, you Dave mean? Price, David Price could be very oh, okay. moody. So, and I think he terrified people sometimes. He famously made multiple, like, I think he said multiple Hall of Famers cry versus him in Magic tournaments. Just just to give you an idea what? of like, yeah. Okay. It's so just a, very intimidating. Very intimidating. Uh and you would not expect it. And it just comes out of nowhere and people did not like it. So he wasn't mm. always as fun as I was, maybe. Um so yeah, I kind of became um but he was also very vocal on like all the cheating stuff and um uh but it was all but it was always more of a battle for him because except for the Pro Tour he won. He won a pro tour and he got a second in the. F I want to say he got second place in the first American Grand Prix. He lost to Mike Long in the finals, but mm -hmm. maybe it was the second American Grand Prix. I don't remember. Um, but he got. He just did, overall did not do well in big tournaments, so he was he was known as the king of the qualifiers for a while because he just. So he was always going to qualifiers and I wouldn't have to go. And because they were so far away from Ithaca, I just couldn't really justify going along for the ride. So, uh -huh. so magic was definitely more of like a death struggle for him at times than it was for me. He had, he had to put so many, so many miles on his car and so many long rides. So like, uh, I think it was at times it was just, uh, more brutal for him when something bad would happen in a tournament because it was just, it was, it was just taking up a lot. It was just a lot tougher for him at times. I got, like, there's a, an amazing, I want to say it's called the town of red house or something. There's this P PTQ report where he drove from Ithaca. I want to say to Iowa, which is not close. Oh my goodness. And there was, um, a PTQ on Saturday and Sunday. Okay. And I want to say that he lost in the finals on Saturday and then won on Sunday. And it was just like the most insane. I was like, mm -hmm. I cannot believe you drove that many hours. Yeah. Lost in the finals yeah. and actually won on Sunday. Like it was just the craziest. Because if he had, I, 
I mean, it, when he lost the finals the first day, it was just devastating. I was like, yeah, it's just crushing. Right. I know earlier, earlier I had said that like I would love to come in second in a one slot. It's like not a if thing. you're driving to Iowa. Yeah, but that right. Ithaca. But when but when all your friends are Brudo. already well, when your friends are already qualified for the Pro Tour and you drove mm. 17 hours by yourself and you have a paper due on Tuesday that you don't know when you're going to write it. Only and, unbelievable stress, yeah. 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 So it was it was tougher for him. So maybe that it was also he was also just a naturally more introverted, moody person. Uh but yeah, I was I guess I was like the front man, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, what what was it why do you think um Dave wasn't able to convert at PTs? Was it just variance or was it something else? Uh I don't think he was I don't think he was as as naturally good at magic as as most of the rest of us um or at least as like the um not as team dead guy i just mean uh at, uh cuz i don't think on average we were that good at magic um but just like as good as the other like top tier players i don't i think he maybe was a notch below but he also like really only liked playing particular kinds of decks and he got a lot of pleasure from building those and doing well with those so maybe that hurt him a little there definitely was variance um, yeah, like I'm, <laughs> there's a Grand Prix where he was, like for example, there's a Grand Prix where he was eighth after the f 14th round and then he won the 15th round and got ninth. Like I remember like stuff like that would happen to him. He'd just be like, what, what just happened? Um, that's strange. Yeah. yeah. Like really wild stuff. Uh, um, so he did have some bad luck. Uh, he did really well. He did re pretty well. Like he did you know, well at US Nationals. Um, he did well in some non pro tour type tournaments. Uh yeah, I don't know. Probably mostly variants. Um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got so. it. Yeah. Um and he did guys get... and not not cheating hurt you back then, to be honest. Not so not cheating hurt. Yeah. So yeah. um yeah. Oh, I definitely want to get to that. But uh one last thing about uh Dead Guy here is just yeah. uh how did you guys convince Finkel to join Team Dead Guy? I understand that he was East Coast Assassins before then? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Did we really call him Team Dead Guy? I, I actually don't really even remember because it didn't it's not like we had like a official thing. Um, or did you start working more closely together? Oh, with yeah, him we worked really somehow? closely with, with John. Um, I be, we became friends with John. Uh, I remember he came up before Worlds, whatever Worlds that Brian Selden won that John and I both made top eight. Uh, John had come up, I guess it must have been 98. Uh, yeah, I think it was Worlds 98, maybe 99. I don't know. We don't, doesn't matter. Like John had come up and I was living by myself in Connecticut at the time at the job I had post-college before I got into options trading. And John just came up and stayed at my apartment for... I don't, I don't remember how long. Some period of time, we just tested for worlds together. So, uh, yeah, we worked really closely with John. We were really good friends with John. Um, and, uh, yeah, maybe we briefly were calling him Team Dead Guy, but I don't really remember the details. I know that sounds mm -hmm. weird, but it was all very loose back then. It wasn't like we had team yeah. sponsorships or... And I don't even think... Honestly, I don't even remember if there were any team tournaments that we played as a team because there weren't like team Grand Prix back then. Um, there were team PTs, right? Or maybe that was later. No, there were team PTs, but those were late. I think the first one was later after okay. we had sort of like, I might be wrong on that, but I don't remember ever playing a team. I have a feeling the team PTs were slightly later when we had all sort of stopped playing playing as much um okay partially just because okay. of getting jobs partially because of poker poker just had such a weird bad effect on american magic um but yeah we, we were always really close to john so mm -hmm. tell me about when you guys were playtesting like um I understand there was some sort of scuffle that happened between you and John, and it involved you calling him Mr. President or not calling him Mr. Oh, President. Oh, well, it wasn't a scuffle. So <laughs> there, uh, some one of the New York Magic players started calling John Mr. President for some reason, 
and he absolutely hated it. He just hated it so much. And so I, we started doing it from time to time to annoy John when we, when John could be a lot sometimes, right? Like, uh, obviously, uh, he knew he was better than everyone else and we knew he was better than everyone else. But, you know, whenever he would start kind of like pontificating on something to like a ridiculous degree or oh, trying to rough or, it in or, or rub trying, it in trash talk or, okay. or just, you know, just like being like telling you something you did wrong that you already knew you did wrong or just like being a little too full of himself or maybe trying to be funny when he's not that funny. Uh, we would give him the Mr. President and he would okay. hate it. Give the needle. Yeah. So during our play testing, I don't remember how he convinced me that we would play, I want to say 40, 40 matches uh -huh. of, it was, it was standard, I believe it was standard mono blue forbidian, which is like an Ophidian forbid deck. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe is what we were playing. And uh, I don't remember how many matches he had to win, but if he won a certain amount, I would not, I would lose my rights. I would no longer be able to call him Mr. President. And he just absolutely beat the shit out of me. I mean, embarrassing. I, I want to say I lost like 31 of the 40 matches or something. Like, okay. it was so hard to beat him at that kind of magic when, when if I was sitting home with another good magic player watching, maybe they would be like, I think this is what you're doing wrong. But I think the way it went down, I was, I just made the same mistake. I just couldn't figure out what I knew I was making the same mistakes over and over, but I couldn't figure it out. And he's just too good. I mean, that's exactly, I mean, He's really tough. He's really tough to beat at that at that game, and uh, mm -hmm. and I wasn't as I would I, f I would have a better shot now. I feel like I'm way better uh, um, now, but he beat me so bad, so bad. That was mm -hmm. actually a really amazing couple, however many days it was of testing with him, because he did a lot of stuff in that period where I was like, wow, I've never seen anyone do that before. He did a lot of cool stuff. He was really he was really really good at magic back then. I mean, just incredible. Um, I've seen people who are as good as him now since, but back then it was just like, he just, yeah, he was just so far ahead of everyone else. Um, but he, there was just it. something innate about his abilities or yes, absolutely. Like stuff yeah. was obvious to him. That was not obvious to other people. Uh, yeah, he's just, he yeah. was really incredible. Um, yeah. And yeah, he, I, he just beat me really, really, really badly, and I couldn't call him Mr. President anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it this is like with with the two of you switching decks and playing? No, like... we literally just played a mirror. Like we just play, we both had a copy of the deck, and we just jammed. Oh, the mirror. it was a mirror match. Mirror you just match. beat the crap out of you. Yeah, okay. absolutely destroyed me. Yeah. Wow. Identical decks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not. Yeah. yeah. It, didn't, it didn't look good for me. It, it wasn't like a result that I was. Yeah. Uh -huh. He, yeah. He, yeah, losing mm -hmm. losing seventy five percent of the matches in the mirror may, does not make yeah. you look good. But if I may ask you to pontificate on your abilities, I've heard accounts that you also had a very um, like a quick thinking brain. You had like a you were pretty like you were a pretty intuitive magic player as well, right? Like maybe not on the level of a John Finko, but like you 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 knew what you were doing, right? Oh it, yeah, I, I'm good at magic. I mean. Um... I'm sorry if that sounds like a very uh, weird question, but, but it's like I just, just to get you know, listeners may not know. It, it so, just depends on yeah. who you compare me to. Like, um, yeah, I'm never, I'm never gonna be as good as the best people. Like, you know, there, there, you know, people like John and LSV, uh, Huey Jensen, Paulo. Mm -hmm. uh raptor hayne alexander hayne like 
those people are better than me in a way that I could never be that good. Like there's other people who I, I maybe I'm there's other people I feel like were better than me at magic, but that's because all they did was play magic. And I'm not saying that LSV had LSV's played an insane amount of magic. And I and I actually I have not played very much magic. Like if you look at how many pro tours I played, how much magic online I've played, how many Grand Prix I played. Um it's just not that it much magic. It doesn't it's, compare to an LSV or somebody no, else. Like yeah. there was a year where Paul Rietzel played the most magic online matches of anyone in the world by like a huge margin. And I, I, I can't compete with, and, and I don't think Paul Rietzel's like uh, naturally as much better at magic as someone like John is or someone like LSV is. But how, how could I ever, they're, they're just playing five, ten times as much magic as I am. Someone like Brad Nelson, who I think is incredible at magic, but he was also playing literally 10, 20 times as much magic as me. Um, so how good would I be if I, if I had done that for an assembly of time? I don't know. Like, um, you know, during that ether revolt era where I, I did just do nothing but play magic for a few months, I was, I was really good then. Like I felt like I could beat anybody. Um, you know, I, I don't mean LSV good. I don't mean John good, but, mm -hmm. uh, um, I wasn't that good, but, uh, you know, by, I made top eight of Grand Prix, and then we went nine and zero on day one of, at the Team Grand Prix the next weekend. Like I was playing Magic really well then, so I so it's difficult to say how good I would have been uh, if I played a ton. But I'm never never would have been. I could never be Alexander Hain. I could never be John Fingal. I could never be LSV. Th those people I think are just better than me in a way that no amount of. Um, I mean, I could obviously, if I was playing every day and they weren't playing at all and we played in a pro tour, yeah, I might have an edge over them that day. Uh, just mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. um, but, but I'm not the same kind of player they are. Like if, if given equal amount of practice or whatever, those guys are always going to be meaningfully better than me. Like they're, they're, they mm -hmm. just have something I don't have. Um, mm -hmm. and that's sort of like, you know, that's kind of been where I find I end up where like, I'm pretty naturally good at games. Um, but once people get serious, I'm, I'm, I'm never end up being the best, but that's fine. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So let's, uh, let's talk about it. I want to talk about the, the cheating era, like everything that I've you got to set the story straight because I didn't play competitive back then, but every single thing I read about competitive magic in the nineties was like, it was rampant cheating. If you weren't cheating, you weren't trying hard enough. It was just like, it was normalized and it was just like the wild, wild west out there. Like, is that, is that, is that a factual <laughs> statement or is it something else? So it's weird because in some ways, how would I know? Because I think that because we very early on, I mean, you can find very early like Usenet posts from me and David Price um, talking about cheating, encouraging people to, um, you know, essentially rat out cheaters, let people know who the cheaters were. Um, people knew that we would not stand for it and we were trying to get rid of it. So I literally think there were just groups of people who they all knew each other cheated, but they just wouldn't tell us. Right. Um, and there wasn't sophisticated judging at times. It almost felt like, you know, obviously like Mark Rosewater has gotten a lot of flack for people think he essentially like ignored Mike Long cheating because he wanted like a, you know, like a WWF style villain or something. Like a um, heel or a villain. Like a heel, or something, exactly. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, exact. I know Mark's talked about it at length, so I don't, I don't want to like put words in his mouth or whatever, but, um, so in some ways, like I could only know what was happening in my matches. I mean, I, sure. In and, your reality. Yeah. And people weren't going to cheat against me because they might get caught. So they're just, 
Um, I, I remember I did what I went through all the Grand Prix results at some point for a handful of players and the win rate. So it used to be, we all had, we would be like the normal Grand Prix, I think was nine rounds day one, but all the like pro players would have three buys. So we wouldn't start playing till round four. The win rate for people who I suspected were cheaters in rounds like four, five, six, seven was just crazy. Like they just never lost. Like even in sealed deck, just never lose. And it was just not possible. Like, you know, I was winning 85% of my rounds, four, five, six matches. They were winning like 97% of their round four, five. Like they just never lost. Basically, and, 100%. Yeah. And I think that that's what people did. They just, if they played against Joe Schmo in round five, they just weren't going to lose. And sometimes I did. Uh, you know, obviously, Mike Long, I, the cheating stories just never stop with him. There's a million of them. Um, I mean, he won a pro tour, cheated in the finals on camera. Uh, you know, there's a whole, uh, yeah, there was, there was a lot of cheating. Um, and it was hard to know the extent of it. Uh, and it was frustrating. Um, and every once in a while, it's, I, I do, st there have been times over the past few years where like, uh, I still just get so angry about it. Um, like what happens? Something gets brought up or oh, just oh, here's, here's a, a new good sheet example. happens. So or? do you, um, what's his name? Dan Lanthier. Is that his name? Canadian player won a couple of Grand Prix. I think that's his name. I don't want to say the, I'm wrong, not familiar. the wrong player's no. name. Anyway, people know no. who I'm talking about. I think that's his name. Um, if I have it wrong, I apologize to whoever that is. Uh, anyway, Canadian player who I, he's always fine, but he won like, I want to say he won two Grand Prix in a very short period of time. And this was like during the period where I was going to a lot of Grand Prix and you know, I was getting a lot of like 11 and fours and just like trying really hard and being like, I can't believe I'm just not top any of these Grand Prix. I was during the Hall of Fame stuff too. So I had a lot of that frustration, but I was just like, you know, maybe I just suck. Like, how the hell does this guy have two? How does this guy win two Grand Prix? I can't even make top eight. Like, I must be terrible. And then a few months later, and this was like a big thing on Twitter. He got caught on camera blatantly cheating in like a store tournament for like a box. And I just sort of lost it. I was like, I spent months of my life like depressed because this guy won two Grand Prix mm -hmm. and I didn't. And it turns out he's just a fucking cheater. Like I was so mad. Like it really mm. made me just never want to play magic again. And I, I know that it was like an overreaction, but it just hit me so hard. It just made it seem so pointless that like, even now, like I'm going, you still get to, angry thinking I'm, about it. I'm getting on a plane, like flying across the country, go 11 and four. And like, I'm upset because some other guy top eight it again. And it just turns out he was cheating. The guy who, who, in Europe, whose name I don't remember, who wrote the big apology. He like, he won so many, he made top eight, at, like so yeah. many Grand Prix. And it just turns out he was just mana weaving the whole time. Like, okay, well, I guess. So it's just very frustrating to devote your life to something, mm -hmm. not do as well as you want. Benchmark yourself to people where you're like, I, I feel like I should be doing as well as this person. Become... Mm -hmm essentially become unhappy because of it and then find out the whole thing was bullshit. That was not. So a couple of those have, have really angered me. Yeah. Um, you know, at the times where I was like, had spending a lot of time on magic and, and, and not being half that I've done. Like, yeah, to, to have that like thrown in your face is upsetting. Uh, but yeah, back then it, it turns out just a lot of people were cheating. Like if you look at the, Grand Prix top eights from back then. It's like a lot of people who now people think cheated. Even people who I consider friends now, I think they did things back then that maybe they didn't really understand were cheating or maybe they thought everybody did it or the rules didn't really prevent it. Um, 
that, things that's like what point. I wanted to ask about. Like, like was it was it just a culture where it just like it it just felt like you you kind of someone told me I'm not saying uh, it, it was a pro player, but he said he played Magic in the '90s. It felt like he had to like cheat because he felt like everyone was cheating. So it's kind of like steroids in baseball. If you're not doing it, then you're like you're just behind that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, maybe that is just what was happening, and we were just dumb. I mean, I. I don't know about dumb. Well, right. I mean, well, we were whatever. We were putting integrity. ourselves at disadvantage. Um, I, right. I, I, why, why? Part of the problem is just that people were young. People were really young. and yeah. Young plus there's money on the line plus right. there's lax so judging, as you when mentioned. You are, so. When you were 16 or 17 years old and you were trying to fly across the country to play Magic or even just – drive a few hours to pay 50 bucks to enter a tournament and maybe you're relying on your parents to borrow their car or for gas money. If you don't win money in the tournament, you might not be able to go to the tournament the next week or something, mm -hmm. right? Like there's a, it was a lot different, especially because like the hobby was younger and people didn't necessarily know that their cards were going to be worth $500 one day and maybe the whole <laughs> yeah. thing just felt Nobody like knew. like a like a more pointless endeavor and it's not and it's never been cheap it's never been a cheap hobby right like mm -hmm. uh and people who are young make bad decisions and they uh are better at maybe justifying it or if they're off, it's a lot obviously peer pressure is a much bigger deal when you're younger so if everyone else is doing it you just do it too um mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, right. If we looked at the early DCI scores or whatever they're called, um, DCI rate rankings, or uh, there's a whole era of top eights. Yeah, there are a lot of cheaters, and a lot mm -hmm. of them really didn't like us. <laughs> we didn't like them, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was difficult to do anything about it because you needed a lot of judges and you need the judges to know what to look for. Like, you know, it took a long time to educate people on like the, the double nickel, which is what the pile shuffling thing is where if you just yeah separate lands and spells and then just deal yeah. into piles. That's, it's, that's not okay. Yeah. Right. Mana weaving is not um, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's not like, it's not like there's like different shades of, cheating where that's right. okay and they're so. like early stages of, of some uh, some early magic rules actually made cheating easier like no sleeves they, they didn't think that like sleeves oh uh, are... yeah different yeah. sets yeah. yeah yeah that was pretty vicious um mm. yeah the cheating was frustrating and we just tried to stop it but like it, we didn't have a real mechanism to stop it and us being so vocally anti-cheater like I said, it kind of cut us off from really knowing what was going on because people mm -hmm. just, uh, yeah, they didn't, they didn't want Yeah, I guess you yeah. couldn't like work the system from within if right. you, and, because and, you were doing that. At, at that st everyone was so young back then that we were also on the older side, even though we were only like 21 mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, yeah. There was still a lot. That's back when like uh, pro tour top eights were way more likely to have a teenager in them than they, than they are now. Things were a little different. Sure. There were some older yeah. people, but not... You know, Magic didn't start, so, you know, um, unless they started playing Magic when they were 30, they they couldn't be Magic players in 1997. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, uh, we, we had some people we had very bad, contentious relationships with. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I have, there's random Pro Tour stories I have of, of, of the people trying to do shady things against me and, like, uh, I remember I played Ryan Fuller, very famous Canadian magic cheater, just a really unpleasant, terrible person. Um, he had, you know, he had a little kind of a group of people who hung out who I just thought were all basically just thieves because they were just obviously cheating. I played him at the pro tour that Dave won, uh, the Tempest block. But uh, in that set, um, the Wrath of God in Tempest is called the Winds of Wrath. Uh, it only destroys unenchanted creatures. So right. if, if your creature has an unholy strength on it, your creature doesn't, nothing happens to it, right? 
So our mm -hmm. deck had giant strength in it, um, which is plus two, plus mm -hmm. two for two red. Because not yep. only was it just kind of good in our deck, but it protected you from the Wrath of God. So I remember in the, when I played him in the tournament, you know, I had out, I think I had out a creature maybe with two, maybe even two giant strengths on it. I had a giant strength creature in play that was killing him, and he just cast Winds of Wrath, and I was like, all right. Like, cool, bro. Yeah. yeah. Like, and I was like, did he think this is going to work? Like, and if I had, like, it's just stuff oh, like, yeah. yeah. So Probably like, just try to try to make you bend it, yeah. Right, yeah. and and if I had bend it, I'm I'm sure. I mean, it's possible that he knew he was losing that game, so he was just doing it to mess with me because he knew I wasn't going to bend it. But that's the kind of thing. That, but against you know random Joe Schmo in round four, he, that they mm -hmm. bend it. He just he just goes on with his life. Okay, your creature's dead, and that was very mm -hmm. common. Um, but the rules were also uh, a lot less clear back then about um, what you were responsible for. Like if you're, uh, like you know your triggers, their triggers, that kind right. of thing. Like so, you have like now. if if they bend their creature that wasn't supposed to die, the rules were not clear on what you what your responsibilities were. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of weird stuff like that, and uh, and, and also that, lighter punishments, right? Like if you if you got caught, you just like roll back or something. Like uh, there's no, or were there infractions already in? <laughs> Or maybe there were, but so not I, well enforced. So I would say back then, um, it was really volatile because the first, right. So at first you could kind of like just get away with a lot of stuff. And then when they finally started listening to us and kind of put in like a first set of infractions, I think they were actually like too harsh where, um, Sort of like, well, do, do you know the David Mills Pro Tour final story? I, I do not, and and listeners may not. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, you could so probably definitely at the Pro Tour LA, one of the draft tournaments. Um, there's a player named David Mills, who was definitely I I don't know if David Mills is a cheater, but he was on Team Tongo Nation, which was Mike Long and a bunch of people who. I definitely think we're cheaters. Associated with cheaters. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But he essentially got DQ'd in a Pro Tour Finals for like, for some reason for this tournament, they basically said you had to like, it was something really crazy. Like you had to like tap your lands. It was something about the way you had to tap your lands and announce spells. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, announcing spells. I don't know if it, I, I didn't know it was with Mills, but there was some DQ based right. on that. Right, so I yeah. don't remember what exactly they wanted us to do. And for most people, that was just the way they naturally played Magic already. But for him, it was not. Um, mm -hmm. And he got DQ in the finals. That's how Tommy Hovey won his second Pro Tour, was against mm -hmm. a DQ in the finals for some dumb reason. But to be honest... Part of the reason that rule was instituted was because mm -hmm. of so Justin Schneider, uh, who um, his brother Brian, I'm friends with, great guy. Uh, just they are from Virginia and were friends with Mike Long. Uh, Justin Schneider was one of the you know youngest, most prolific cheaters in Magic history. He would do, th I played against him. He would do things like, uh, he would have like nine lands, tap all nine lands, untap all nine lands, tap all nine lands, untap. Then he would finally tap them all, put them in a big pile, and cast two five casting cost spells. Like they would do stuff like this all the time. So I think the reason this rule was instituted was because of the people David Mills associated with doing stuff like this where, so it, it was kind of instituted so that other people were like actually able to track that your spells and the lands you were tapping made sense together. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, there's tons of stories. Uh, someone just told me a story. Uh, it might've been Brian Hacker telling me a story just recently where at the, Mirage pre-release Pro Tour, I think, where his opponent had 10 lands and uh, tapped them all, just put them in a pile and said, uh, Caravix Torch you for 10. And Brian's just like, you only have 10 lands. Like, just stuff, stuff like that used to happen all the time. 
Um, so that's why that rule was instituted. Uh, but there was definitely, we, we've had that from time to time in Magic, where every once in a while there's this rule that's like too punitive and it like doesn't make sense and then they have to like roll it back. Um, yeah. How to deal with, Magic is hard to keep track of and it's, yeah, it kind of stinks that um, sometimes live tournaments just have important matches that the what the rules were not enforced or somebody uh it's just hard to keep track of i, I remember at uh the the grand grand prix orlando the ether revolt grand prix that and i had played probably more of that set than anyone in the room and i remember i again who was i playing doesn't matter uh i feel like i know who it was though um i didn't attack uh with a frontline rebel has to attack each turn. No one in the mm -hmm. world had cast more frontline rebels than me. Like literally, I, 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 t I, I was tweeting about frontline rebel constantly. No one on earth had cast that card of Magic Online more than I had. And then when I got to a live tournament, I forgot to, I forgot how to attack every turn. So I just, it's just really hard to. Um, yeah, Magic Online does it for you as well. Yeah, it's just way, really so. hard to remember to keep track of the game, and because mm -hmm. of that. Uh, it's also really hard to know when someone did it on purpose and when they didn't. And cheating has just mm -hmm. always been a problem. Um, getting the rules right where they punish cheaters, prevent cheating, yeah. but punish honest mistakes to like the right extent. The whole unintended consequences kind of deal. Yeah, it's very tough. I mean, you know, the the tracking people from tournament to tournament is a very good strategy because then you can kind of like get a sense of like, is, a, is, this, is this person making too many accidental right. mistakes? Is this person pushing things? But in the, in the one match though, when you, you just when, don't know, you just don't know, you don't, you know, it's not gonna make you feel better. Uh, when you find out that they got DQ'd a month later, you're like, well, okay, mm -hmm. well, I, I, I flew to California and lost to them. So I don't feel, you know, it doesn't help me. I don't get my plane ticket back because they got yeah. banned. Yeah, can't roll that back. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So so yeah. yeah. The cheating was was uh, it was annoying and um, definitely made things less friendly for us at times. Uh, you know, the Magic Invitational, um, which is how we got Medley Mage. Uh, you know, that was supposed to be a fun tournament every year, but there would always be like one or two or three people who I just thought were cheaters in that tournament, and it made it really unpleasant. Like, you go to a tournament that's like supposed to be a good time, and it just really just took the fun out of it. Um, you know, in, so in uh, in the tournament where... Uh, that, that I won to to I beat John in the finals and got to make Mething Mage. Late in that tournament, I was actually fighting for the final spot with Mike Long. So I think maybe John was far. I don't remember the exact standings, but I just got so obsessed with not letting Mike Long beat me. Like I just couldn't. I really. It's not about winning, but it's about not losing to Mike Long. Right, but I ended up rules lawyering Z really, really viciously in that tournament, and I feel bad about it. Um, because you just wanted to have a certain standard be, that no, because I, I just playing. I just wanted to beat Mike, and I was like, if I lose, I think maybe Z was like a match behind us. Oh, I so, see. You needed to get to Mike, Mike, the end boss. So you needed so to, I, I just needed yeah. to stay ahead of Mike. And I was like, well, if Z beats me and then Mike wins. Now he's tied with us or ahead of us. I, I just, I just couldn't, I just went into like full blown, like angry tournament mode because I was in contention with someone who I disliked so much. Um, so yeah. So then I ended up doing something, the exact thing that I would have hated if someone did in that tournament because I just took what was supposed to be like a fun, cool tournament and sort of made it shitty for Z. Um, but I was, I just, I just went into a different mode because there were people there who, you know, didn't allow me 
they prevented me from relaxing and just having a good time because I just didn't like them. I didn't like what they stood for. I didn't think they should be there. And the idea that he did eventually win an invitational. Um, and it's great that no one cares about his card at all, but, uh, I actually don't know he had a card. Oh um, yeah. Uh, it's called, it's a merfolk. It's okay. a little, Oh, that's not important then. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not very good. It's uh, okay. I can't believe I can't remember the name of it, but, uh, yeah, he would, he brought out right that day. He definitely like brought out the worst in me. Cause I just, yeah. I was like, if I just keep winning, Mike's not in and that, so, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah I, yeah, there it, it did, and even now, like even somewhat recently, it's just a drag to have to play against the cheaters. It's just so, it's so much like, it's just like mentally mental, taxing, energy, yeah. anguish. It's yeah, vicious. You have to be on, you have to be vigilant on guard the whole time. So, yeah. So yeah, it was, it was. I, I think it was. <laughs> we probably were even a little ignorant to how bad it was then. I think that. Uh, I mean, even though we, we did see it happening, like I, you know, we would see things for a while. You weren't allowed to unintentionally draw. I don't know if you knew that. Not a good rule. So like, I did not know that there was a period. There was a period where you, where you, could where you, where you couldn't, you, you, uh, okay. It, you, right. You couldn't intentionally draw. I don't know what I just said. Yeah. You were not allowed to ID. So, you know, we went to tournaments where we saw people just sort of like purposely stall out or, um, were like not killing, like they, they'd obviously agreed to a draw before the match mm -hmm. and, uh, we're just going to like fake a real match. And we did see stuff like that happened. Um, I think we stupidly thought if we just didn't get cheated our matches and played our best, um, we'd be able to compete. But in retrospect, that's just not really true. It's like, every loss is just like such a big deal and at, you really to, to like to win a tournament, you just need so much luck. And those, so many people were just like, you know, that, well, what could a, you have yeah. done differently? Because like, I, I don't, I don't understand the I, alternatives. I mean, the, well, I, I it, <laughs> nothing, I guess just not tried, just said, I'm not going to bother with this because I can't win. I can't, I'm never Oh, I see. like, or, or tried even harder or been more, we could put all our effort into just trying to catch people. Like, um, I don't know. I, I think I, but, but at the, at the time, I think I underestimated how, obviously, like I said, I don't know how many people cheated. Uh, and I don't know how much they cheated. Um, you know, uh, someone like John might have a better idea because he was pretty young and I know that the young people confided in each other more. Um, but now that I feel like I kind of understand how like small the edges are and, and how having a 5% better winning percentage is like a huge deal, uh, yeah, the people who who played honestly yeah. were at a pretty big disadvantage. That stuff all compounds, right? Whether it's an advantage yeah. or a disadvantage. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and eventually, like you know, I think we did have influence. They started to take cheating more seriously. Uh, I think, um, you know, Sheldon Menery, who recently passed away, uh, I feel like he he was always good about giving me a lot of credit. Um, in some ways, I feel like he remembers a lot of the details better than I do because he was involved. He, cause he when was when I judge. talked to Sheldon for that interview, he mentioned you actually yeah. specifically by name. Yeah. When he was a judge. Um, so yeah, we did, we did just try to like do whatever we could to clean it up. Um, and, uh, it seems like things got better, but there, and but there's still, there's always been cheaters and it just, it's never really yeah. stopped. And it's, it's just an unfortunate, part of magic um do get a lot of entertaining stories non-magic players love magic cheater stories like 
if, if the, the magic cheater stories are easy to illustrate to other people, I've, I've got a lot of like mm -hmm. entertainment value I mean, from those. How outlandish they are, how yeah, brazen they are, just show, all like, kinds of stuff. Anything that involves where you can like see someone do like sleight of hand on a YouTube video people love or, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was stuff like that. Uh, so cheaters have given us some, some, some level some, of entertainment, some, some level of entertainment to at least make up for like the, everything else that's horrible. Yeah. But, uh, and, and I know that a lot of the cheating was done by very young people and I'm not gonna, some people change. I mean, some people don't, they're just kind of shit bags their whole life, but, uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's people who cheated when they were 17 and now they're 27 and they're regretted and. I, I don't I don't judge people necessarily based off that. Uh mm. but yeah, it just sucks. And the people mm. who are like thirty five years old and, and cheating at their local store event, I, I just can't I just don't even know. Yeah. It's just like a mental yeah. it's just like Yeah, there's something something like morally or ethically <sighs> wrong there. Yeah, um, or it's an it's, it's an or it's an addiction. I, I don't know. It's a lot it could be a lot of things, yeah. But it's not yeah. but man, it's hard to forgive yeah um is it true that you were the you and dave or team dead guy was also unpopular wizards or the wizards party line at the time for being outspoken on these issues oh that... I, don't, I don't think so no you don't um, think so okay so maybe that's a uh, misrepresentation on my part what made you say that maybe maybe it's true i don't know um I because I just I'm just trying to put two and two together. Let me explain it. Like like because I know that folks like Rosewater and Scaff Elias they were like campaigning for folks like Mike Long. So I was just kind of like putting two and two together. It'd be like, well, if these guys are trying to be put on the pedestal, then yeah, but they campaign. You're for, trying to, but we were the good guys. Yeah. They campaigned for us too. Um, <laughs> okay. So like I mean okay. I, I got I was in all the duelist invitationals, you know, um, and some that's, of those Mark chose, some of them were votes. I, some of them were, I don't remember how they mm -hmm. all worked out, but. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe just unpopular with certain players who are cheaters. Obviously there's, there must've been one cheater who didn't uh, cast her vote for you for the hall of fame. Oh, at 100%. Least. Yeah. yeah. There's no question but, that I, that I missed out on hall of fame votes in the early days from people who didn't like mm -hmm. us for that reason, but I probably got votes from people who, who didn't necessarily think I should be mm -hmm. in. So I that don't know if be. that. I mean, yeah. I, I would certainly say on average, cheating, that whole anti-cheating thing gained me votes, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I did it every now and then um, because we were young, too. I am sure that I overstepped my bounds with Wizards people, either in terms of like telling them they sucked at their job oh, or just communication in some way or acting entitled about what was owed to us as magic players. I'm sure that I did not, there, there's no way, uh, I always handled it. Well, um, I did have a period of time where I thought Scott Larrabee was either annoyed with me or didn't like me or was pissed at me. I don't know. I don't know if he watches these. I, I don't know if it's true. Um, and it might just be because at some point when I was young, I just acted like a dick. And even though I was correct overall about uh, the cheating thing, I, I would not say that Dave and I were uh, mature people who were always nice or or like uh, appropriately aggressive. Like we, I'm sure that... Um, I would handle many aspects of it differently now. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. we were on the right side of things, but yeah, I'm I'm sure at some point I was a jerk to a judge or a jerk to someone who I thought cheated and didn't, or a jerk to you guys. You guys were emotional, and people probably reacted emotionally. It goes both ways. So yeah, and and I think that you know my personality was always very much. Yeah, I. I I would try to like call attention to myself, call attention to a situation, call attention to someone who I thought was doing something dumb or bad. So, uh, mm -hmm. right. So, uh, I could cause, I could cause a ruckus maybe inappropriately. <laughs> uh, were you ever in some sort of like physical danger from what you did or oh, what you said? I don't think so. No, I did have okay. never got that one time, one time and not, in a match tournament, like 
at like a restaurant near the magic tournament, Mike Long got really weird with me, like got really up in my face, but that was it. Never, never anything else. Okay. Man, it's, it's really like, it's really hard to put two new together for me in terms of Mike Long. Like just, he, he just seems like just all the accounts just made him sound like just a general, not pleasant person. I mean, oh, I, I don't want, I mean, I just, there's people in the world who are just not like the rest of us. And I just don't think he's like the rest of us. I think there's just something off about him where he just doesn't. Yeah, just, just the, the does, conscience or something. Yeah, something. Know? He just doesn't seem to think about mm -hmm. things the way I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I also want to know, like, um, this zero tolerance for cheating for you and David, maybe it's different between the two of you, but for you, like, where does this attitude come from? Was there, is it just like innate in you? Like, was there some incident that made you, um, go really hard on this topic? Like what, what was it exactly? Uh, most of my life I've kind of been a rules follower. So that's certainly part of it. Um, but also I, I just think that we, you know, we were in it because we enjoyed the game and we enjoyed the competition and we just felt like it invalidated the competition. Um, and maybe at that time, certainly on the East Coast, um, West Coast group is a little different. They were older, I think, on average, like the West Coast players. On the East Coast, people were pretty young. So a lot of the people we were playing against the Magic every weekend were, you know, John Finkel was like 16 or something. Jamie Park was 15. Playing against a lot of like high schoolers. Um, I, I think maybe for us, it just felt like the stakes were higher. It's like, we're like, you know, we're in college. Um, we have exams and papers and we have like stuff to do. And we're, we don't like what we really like this. And this isn't just some for us, some way for us to waste time on weekends. This isn't just a way where we have nothing else to do, but, yeah. but we can make, it's not just like we, throwing rocks at the wall. But we can right? make six, so don't ruin it. And we can make 60 yeah. bucks on a Saturday. Like we were genuinely interested in the competition and it just felt like it invalidated the competition. I mean, I do think that, you know, Dave, I don't know what you, what you would call it, like a righteous streak in him or whatever. Uh, and maybe me, I had it a little bit and he had it a lot. Like, um, maybe we did start to get like self-esteem, like from feeling like, like we were better than other people because we were the ones who were anti-cheating and that, um, and once we started to get positive feedback about that, that probably fed on itself a little too. Um, but yeah, I've always been a little bit of a rules follower. I've always been like really into like competitive games. So like, right. I just want the game to be real. I don't want to like spend a bunch of time on something and find out someone cheated. It's just a waste of time. Uh, yeah, I think maybe, like I said, just being older made a huge difference back then. I know we weren't old. We were like 20, 21, 22, but 23. Older, relatively speaking, sure. But the, the difference yeah. in, I think the difference in attitude between like a 22 year old and a 16 year old on something like, on something like this can be big. I mean, yeah, it's two worlds. I mean, you'll see kids like you could play like a board game at home and, and 14 year olds will cheat. And you'd be like, what are you doing? We're, we're playing ticket to ride. Why are you like, it's just like, you yeah. know, when my son yeah. was like nine years old and we would play magic, uh, he would like occasionally stack his deck. And I was like, you think I don't know what's going on here? Like, uh, cause it's, cause it's more fun, I guess for him at that age. But, but you just don't think that uh, it's just not a big deal to some, like they don't really, it's also, I think you have to be a little bit older before you get into the mindset where it's stealing. You don't really think of it yeah. that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, for some of these people, uh, when you're the best player in your store in 1996 or 1997, and you're probably going to win the draft anyway, does it matter if you win a hundred percent instead of, 85 percent yeah like I, I don't know like there's a million ways there, but... there's that whole there's that whole mindset of but, like i deserve to win i don't just, want i don't want variants to, to so we just me. never had yeah. any of that um 
we just didn't have that that kind of mindset because maybe because right we didn't even start playing till we were slightly older so i do think the age thing has something to do with it where we felt a responsibility um too just because like we we're supposed to be the adults in the room i don't know it's just a lot of little things that added up to it uh um, and we were just really excited about magic. We really thought it was cool. We wanted to turn it into a, like a real thing. Like pro, the pro tour was just so exciting. Um, you know, we all played in pro tour one and we were just super jazzed about the whole thing. And I guess we also thought that like, if everyone's just cheating, how is this going to continue? Like they're not gonna, we're not going to be able to have a bunch of tournaments if it's just like, if it's just essentially like the wild west. Um, uh, so yeah, it was just a lot of little reasons. I, I, it's hard to point to a, a particular reason. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's a great yeah. answer, but no, it's a good answer. It's a good answer. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the real answer, yeah. which always makes it the good answer. Yeah. So, yeah. What made you just unsolicited, um, send a signed Foo Fighters poster to worth? Oh, uh, I don't know if I, unsolicited. That was just like a gift to a friend. Well, I mean, I I mean just a surprise for him, right? Oh, so uh, I shouldn't say unsolicited. So I'm really, obviously, I'm super into music, and uh, my music tastes don't overlap with Worth very much, although they overlap more now than they used to because my music tastes have sort of expanded over the years. Uh, not really into the Foo Fighters, though, but that's still. Um, it's just I'm also, uh, me and a few of my friends got super into, like, poster art for a bit. Um Lan Ho, if you know who that is, we, me and him were really into. Mm -hmm. Now he wasn't; he's not into music, but we got into like alternative movie posters. Uh, so I just have a lot of posters, and uh, an artist who I thought was cool, who did some posters I liked. He did a cool Foo Fighters poster, um, and I knew Worth like Foo Fighters. I thought the poster was awesome, so I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna give this to Worth as a as a gift, you know. So it wasn't, I don't know. Yeah, it was unsolicited, but it's just you know, sometimes if you see something cool that one of your friends would like, you know, give it to him. Why not? It wasn't more complicated nice. than that. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah, I, do, yeah. I, I do really, um, I'm really into sort of like illustration art. So, I mean, you can see I have stuff behind me. This mm. is stuff from Warhammer fantasy role-playing. Um, I have a lot, of, like I said, a lot of alternative movie posters. I have a lot of um, gig posters from music events. Uh, I have a handful of like a few magic pieces, a few magic pieces. Um, I just have a lot of, uh, a lot of different kinds of art. So yeah, every once in a while I will see something that I think someone will like and I'll just pick it up for him. So is there a particular, uh, piece of magic related art or memorabilia? That's maybe your favorite one. Well, I mean, I have the original mething mage. Uh, painting, so it's hard for that not to be my favorite one, I guess. Uh, the three magic paintings I have: um, I have Meddling Mage, I have the Richard Kane Ferguson Goblin War Drums, which uh, from Fallen Empires, which I absolutely love. Very lucky to get it. Uh, my friend Nick Detweiler, uh, who I met through the vintage tournaments that I talked about earlier, um, he helped me get Meddling Mage, and then he was trying to like talk me into buying more art later and he's like well what you know what magic card art would you do you like just tell, name a painting you like and i was just like i don't know man i've, I've always liked richard kane ferguson goblin war drums and he was just like he still has that like that was like the one painting that richard kane ferguson still had i i it was totally bizarre so I know. Just, what are the odds yeah, yeah. so so I, I just bought it um and i also have uh crazed armadon um from okay. Tempest. So uh, Tempest was one of the Pro Tours, uh, one of the sets where we really practiced a lot for those Pro Tours, and we practiced a lot with um, Jamie Park and the other people from Syracuse. Um, so I believe that between me and Jamie, we own all the Armadons, and we love the Armadons. We talked about Armadons constantly. <laughs> we just There was a lot of Armadon talk during Tempest Block for us, and... Uh, Actually, we may not have endangered Armadon. Someone else might have endangered Armadon, but we have a. He has okay. trained and trumpeting, I believe, and I have crazed. Uh, 
So. It's funny. I only remember the train armadon. Oh. I must not be as into that armadon yeah. scene. Crazy armadon is a weird were. one uh, because if you just look at the art, it does not look like a green card. Like the armadon itself, I believe, is green, but like it, it's it's very it's very okay. weird when you see it off the card. You're like, whoa, that's a green is card. Is it like the? It's like the whole like Force of Will art direction didn't like match the. Oh no! The it's actual just, it's card. just the uh, it's just the background is really strange. It's like an armadon on this on this uh blue red background it looks like it'd be an is it card it's a little odd uh it's a cool mm. so yeah those are the three magic pieces i have uh okay and uh i do have a lot of random magic stuff i guess uh but i wouldn't say anything that i uh think about very often i mean i do every once in a while we'll open up the box and take a look at stuff every once in a while someone will ask me if i have some back issue of the sideboard or, or duelist or something. Um, but I guess, uh, yeah, that's hard not to say, uh, medley mage is the piece I'm most excited to have, it has obviously. To be. Yeah. Yeah. If you own it. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah. Um, okay. So the next question is, I understand that you are a big fan of Kubrick's movies. So which Kubrick movie is your favorite and why? Oh, well, Barry Lyndon is my favorite film. Uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick, came out in 1975, um, which is convenient because every once in a while people will ask the question, what's your favorite movie from the year you were born? And I get to say it's actually my favorite movie overall. Uh, why is it my favorite? I, I So I've been getting a lot of uh, flack about this question lately because I recently they recently played uh, Barry Lyndon in a theater here in New York. There's a theater here in New York. Um, maybe once a year shows Barry Lyndon on the big screen. Um, it got maybe disrupted by COVID. So I've seen it a few times here now. And I, every year I take people with me and, uh, the people I went with this year, I went out to dinner with a couple of them after and they'd never seen it. And they're like, you know, why do you like it? And, uh, I just have a hard time answering that question. Um, I think part of it is just, it's just the things that Stanley Kubrick is really known for are just so, you know, the cinematography and his framing of shots and his use of music, um, is what, you know, he's, he's really known for that. And not all of his films do it. So there's a few of his films that have a different feel, but like if you were to watch The Shining or 2001 or Barry Lyndon, uh, for example, you, you will see, you know, that, 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 DNA. that signature touch is there. Right. Yeah. Um, and I really, yeah, I don't know. For me, it just really works the best in that film. And I like the tone of the film. Um, yeah, I don't have a great... I just really, really love it. And I never really get yeah. tired of watching it, even though it's incredibly long. It's like three hours and 25 minutes or something. Um, and it's, you know, uh, I'm not a big plot person, so I don't care if nothing happens in a movie, not that nothing, things mm -hmm. happen in Barry Lyndon, um, mm -hmm. but they aren't like, uh, th they're not, it's not a narrative driven movie. Right? It's more like a vibe or a feeling for me. It's a vibe or a feeling. I think there, there is a narrative, but the narrative isn't what makes it interesting. Like a lot of the stuff is, for you, I would say yeah. the narrative is somewhat predictable. So, mm -hmm. uh, which for some people is like not what they want. They don't want a predictable narrative, but that's not, that's not what the movie's about. It's about the way it's presented. Um, and, uh, how the, um, period of time it takes place. And it's a, it's a, you know, period piece. So like how that era is depicted and how the shots and the music convey what's going on. And you actually, actually, the more you watch it, the more, um, the music becomes, I think, uh, a lot more powerful because the first time you watch it, you you don't. The first time you watch it, you might not notice or remember which scenes share music, but then when you've watched it a bunch, you'll watch a scene and you'll have like you'll you'll remember the other scene that that music is in, and that connection is very powerful. Sometimes, like he does a very. Right really good job of, of 
calling to the previous Jeez. scene that makes the current yeah. scene have bigger impact. Um, yeah, yeah, I you, know. you can't get that unless you do a rewatch and you. you I mean, really I th I'm sure it. that some people would do it the first time around, um, mm -hmm. uh, but probably not everyone. And certainly for me, it's gotten stronger with rewatching. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I I just really love it. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, it's it's a long, slow movie, which a lot of younger people. Um, can struggle with, although I just saw it with two 23 year olds and they both really liked it. Um, or three, three 23 year olds, maybe. Cause I, I work with a lot of young people. So I drag them out to events. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I love other Cooper films too. I love Dr. Strange love, um, uh, in particular, uh, you know, I love 2001, uh, mm -hmm. 2001 is an even bigger example of a, of a movie that probably, uh, if there was like um, Steve Soderbergh, you know who Steve Soderbergh is? He, yeah, I think, of course. So I believe that he, I think 2001 is his favorite film. And he did like a, he made a different cut of it that he thought would be more palatable to modern audiences because he, he really felt. Oh, did he? But you can't see it. I didn't so what happened is it's his favorite film. And he like wanted to, sh he wants the world to embrace it, right? He wants the world to love it, but he like recognizes that it's hard for modern audiences to love it because of, because of what it is. It's, it's long, it's, it's slow, slow it's build. weird. Yeah. So he, out of his love for the film, made a cut of it that he thought modern audiences would enjoy that did not lose like the spirit of the film, what made it great. I don't remember how much shorter it was. And this happened maybe 10 years ago or something. And it was online for like a day. And then he got, they were like, you can't put this like, online. You have to take it down. And yeah, I basically got yeah. cease and desisted or, or the Kubrick estate was like, dude, what oh, are you, what are you doing? Maybe, maybe I could still find so it somewhere. But yeah, possible. that's, that's weird because it's just re-edited. That's not yeah, the original movie. But anymore. I think maybe he did it voluntarily. I, I don't know. Maybe it still exists. Um, yeah. but I don't, I don't know if it's easy to see, but anyway, yeah. Like sometimes you do these old films, you wish they, they, you, you could. Yeah. I, no, I, I, I find that I, I find as I, maybe this is part of me getting older. Like I find as I get older, like I start to understand, like, the creators who make these films and novels and pieces of art, there's a very specific intentionality of why they do it. And we shouldn't be like wishing for it to be something else. It is what it is. It's kind of like, you know, you give birth to a child, like you can't be like, Oh, I wish this child was like some, somebody entirely different. You know, they, they grew up to be something entirely different. It's just like, you have to like, I've gotten better at like, and this is just my view, right? I've gotten better at like kind of, respecting maybe not liking but respecting the lines that some directors or movie uh, makers take because i mean th to a certain extent of course but. yeah no i i definitely agree with that but at the same time i feel like uh i often feel like the things worth experiencing um the things that are worth your time it's more about uh, the best aspect of those things. It doesn't matter. Like there's films where, or books, um, music to a lesser extent, because music is kind of a different, you know, a little bit different the way we consume it. But like if a film has a few amazing ideas, it's, to me, it's worth watching, even if the cinematography sucks or the dialogue sucks, because it's showing me something I may not see anywhere else. Um, where other people, I think, maybe view things more holistically. It's like they they. Oh, I see. You're losing out on the accessibility for like maybe more audiences yeah, being so, exposed to those ideas. So I don't. <laughs> I think there's something amazing about 2001. I think there's something amazing about Barry Lyndon. And I don't necessarily think you need all three and a half hours to make someone appreciate that. So it would, so I, so while I don't want to change Ray Linden, I, I do want to like 
find a way to make more people enjoy this type of film. Yeah. Um, Open it up. And if it's a shorter cut of 2001 that would do that, I still think that's a positive. Um, right. I, I, I don't think, I don't think people need to enjoy every something in its entirety to make it, to make it worth it. I don't, uh, um, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, it, it does I, make I, sense. I don't want artists yeah. to change what they do. Um, but if we, you know, uh, feed it to people in a slightly different way, that doesn't really hurt them. I mean, they might be, mm -hmm. they might be pissed because that's, you know, not how people are about yeah. what they've created. Uh, but in the long run, if that helps people, uh, appreciate new things or enjoy new things, that's cool. Um, mm -hmm. so I would have liked to have watched the, uh, modern cut. Um, uh, older movies are tough. They, 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 some, they are just often at a pace that modern audiences, you know, I never watched seven samurai anymore. Like I watched it like twice a long time ago. And every time I look at it, I'm like, Oh man, it's so yeah. long. And someone just told me they watched it and they couldn't believe how slow it was. And I'm just not going to do it. So I always watch different Kurosawa films because even though I'm mm -hmm. 48 years old and my favorite film is Barry Lyndon, it takes a lot for me to be like, all right, I'm going to watch four hours of Seven Samurai right now or whatever it is, three and a half mm -hmm. hours. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, Barry Lyndon. I hope everyone watches it and loves it, even though most people will not mm -hmm. love it. And, and very, very few will love it as much as I do. But we are out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had a really weird exposure to Kubrick because it was my high school drama teacher that made us watch um, like The Shining and uh, A Clockwork Orange, oh, and it was just those like are a little over the top it's, for high school. It's very, it's very hard to uh, to not remember those things, and uh, yeah, a, a it clock, definitely shaped my. A Clockwork Orange yeah. is a very disturbing film. Yeah, it is very disturbing. That's yeah. the that's the point, really. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, as a kid, you don't you don't know that you're just like, oh, what the heck is this? That movie yeah. should not. I don't. It should not be shown to children. Yeah, there's no way for them yeah. to even understand yeah. the point. You'll never understand the point. You're just gonna remember the the horrible things that it's happen. Very, very, very graphic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but anyhow, next question. <laughs> um, for someone who, like me, who is really not that into metal, what is a good metal? starter set or starter kit that someone should attempt if they were to um, enter the genre. Hmm. Well, do you like rock music generally? I do. Yes. Okay. So I would say for the kind of metal that I listen to, um, that I would just, you know, I, I listen to like, uh, what most people would, I guess, call extreme metal. Um, where, screaming involved in right, so, different things. So screaming is the big, block for most people most people who most just most people just like listening to vocalists who can sing well or make some attempt where you can understand what they're saying you know even people who don't really like sing well but they you know does bob dylan sing well i don't know uh, mm -hmm. does Jeff Mangum from neutral milk hotel sing? Well, I, I don't know if I would call it. Well, I, I, I like his mm -hmm. vocals a lot. Um, you know, uh, but I don't, he's certainly not like a classically good singer, but still most people accept that. But when it comes to, you know, a lot of metal, uh, you know, punk and hardcore, a lot of screaming and some people mm -hmm. can handle the screaming, um, you know, Nirvana has songs where Kurt Cobain just kind of screams, right? Uh, yeah. But when it comes to like metal, like death metal, black metal, you you get beyond just screaming. You get people who, you know, like the the the, the words, the the language we use to describe different vocals in metal is ridiculous. We have like there's bird vocals, Nazgul vocals, uh, goblin vocals, Cookie Monster, co Cookie okay. Monster vocals. So like we recognize that. To, to someone who's not used to this kind of music, who doesn't naturally love it, some of the vocals just sound ridiculous. So generally, if people like rock music, I really just try to f feed them music where the vocals are more in line with what normal people think of as vocals. So, um, and a lot of that is like uh, more mainstream stuff, you know, mm -hmm. Metallica, 
James Hetfield's vocals are kind yeah. of like in the realm of what normal people think vocals are. Uh, System of a Down, or I don't right, know. System of a yeah. Down. Uh, you know, Black Sabbath, uh, yeah. Iron Maiden. Um, now, none of that is stuff that really gets into what I'm really into. There are, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of bands in the genres that are really my wheelhouse that have those kind of vocals. And generally, I don't want those kind of vocals. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I uh, very much, not not completely. Uh, you know, there there are there are things that I love that don't fit into this. But a lot of my enjoyment of music comes from music that really just sort of seems to be coming from emotions that I don't experience myself. I'm not a very angry person. I have not had a lot of like hardship or pain in my life. And for whatever reason, I love music that sounds like this person is angry. This person is experiencing pain. That's what I love. Um, I think maybe I'm like, for me, it's like I'm a tourist into something that this is the only way I can really feel it. Um, I've never felt anything this bad. This music is giving me a brief period to know maybe what it feels like to feel this bad. Those vocals tend not to be pleasant. Um, I, I focus on, I really love the vocals that I view them just as like an instrument that, um, that conveys emotion. The lyrics don't usually even mean anything to me. Sometimes I don't even know what they, I, I often don't know what they are. Um, so weirdly speaking, uh, sorry to cut you off, no, but sorry. like weird, weirdly, I have I, I I can kind of understand what you're saying because it's kind of like um, I watch Korean revenge films and I don't do any of this stuff, but for me, it's like I'm somehow drawn to them, right? Right. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I guess that's right. So movies are probably more emotional for me than a normal person too. That's probably why I I don't care about plot as much. Um, yeah, I I I, th I don't I don't know how uncommon that is where people. Um, I'm sure the horror mm -hmm. films are like that. Nobody wants to be terrified in real life, right? Yeah, I like horror films it, too. It gives so. it gives people yeah. a way to a safely experience some feeling. Um, maybe it lets you yeah. expand your life experience without actually having the bad thing happen that you would have to have happen uh -huh. to to have it. Um, so yeah, when it when it comes to if someone told me they wanted to get into metal, but it's usually the vocals that are the blocker. So I will just. Mm. Well, so, that's okay. I mean, yeah. I, I'm just asking you, like, if 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 uh, if vocals were not a blocker, like, what would you recommend, basically? Because otherwise, I would just hear a recommendation about Metallica, and oh, we all know what. I mean, I can just tell Metallica people my is. favorite bands, but I, it's just it depends on. Yeah, this is this is a hard answer. Oh, okay. Um, okay, well, maybe I should be more specific, right? Like, I guess because it's coming from me, so it's like I'm willing to accept um, extreme emotion uh screaming I, I would like there to be some melodic elements in it and I don't, but I don't i don't need yeah uh, okay i don't i don't need it to be from the vocals but i would like to have like something that resembles like you know like um a rock song but maybe maybe yeah, yeah that's, melodic that's is, just where i'm coming melodic from. is not my thing yeah uh, okay there are certainly bands that sound like just more extreme versions of there's a band called Mutoid Man, for example, has clean vocals. They just kind of sound like rock songs, but they're just kind of heavier and faster. The three people in that band all are in other bands that are much heavier than what normal oh. people would like. But that's like a very good like intro to like more um, like a gateway, like a gateway. Okay. There's a band called Baroness. Um, I don't like their newer stuff as much, and their newer stuff really borders more on hard rock than metal, but they're sort of like middle period where um, I think is a very um, easy sell to people. Um, there's a band called Paul Bearer, which is um, maybe in some ways it's, the, it's Barry Lyndon-esque because the songs are really slow and nine minutes long, but Reed Duke is a big fan. I saw Paul Bearer with Reed Duke recently. Uh, so maybe that's okay. a sell to Magic Players. But, you know, it's clean vocals. I think people who like rock music could love that band. Um, but because I come from more of like, uh, 
Yeah, I come from the different side of things. A lot of the bands I love, uh, Inter Arma, who obviously I, I you know, they that's kind of my shirt. That's kind of yeah. my thing. Uh, they don't have a consistent style, so uh, which um, turns out does not does not help your popularity when you don't have a consistent style. Uh, so uh, so they actually do have some very like classic rock type influence songs. But then they have another set of songs um, that don't. Like my favorite band is a band called Neurosis. Um, and they're just, they've been my favorite band since I was like, I don't know, 19 years old or whenever Enemy of the Sun came out, 93, 94. Um, and uh, their, their influences are, are not rock bands. Their influences are these like weird like noise industrial bands and some punk bands but their songs just especially on the albums that i love the most they just don't have any relation to like rock songs the way people think of it like there's no choruses there's no repeats mm -hmm. there's no mm -hmm. um there's no like loud quiet loud it's no just, there actually is a loud. ton of loud quiet loud um uh oh, okay so that it that they do they are masters of loud quiet loud but the periods of time but it's like five minutes of quiet followed by five minutes of loud it's not like uh and their vocals okay. actually um are incredible because the older albums have three vocalists and the way they intertwine them is really great but it is still always screaming um so a lot of the music i like and and right there's a there's a lot of stuff that i really love that just to most people just doesn't even sound like rock music it's just it's just a wall of noise with screaming and to me it's not that but i get why it is to other people um i'm always happy to give music recommendations uh you know but if someone just says hey what music should i what metal should i try it's just a lot of options um i i yeah. really Another thing that's weird about me in music is I really heavily lean towards um, new music and bands that still are out there doing stuff and putting out music because sure. I love live music and yeah. I want to go, I want to listen to bands um, that I can go see. Uh, yeah. And I also just think that the kind of music that I really, really love has only been getting better, really. Um, mm. The particular genres I love. Uh, so I often will just give people recommendations on um, more recent stuff. But like if someone tells me they like classic rock, how do I listen to metal? I'm just going to tell them, well, try Black Sabbath and then we'll go from there. Like, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I don't like a lot of the, like Iron Maiden. I, I can, I've, I've yet to make it through a whole Iron Maiden album. Um, can't stand them, huh? No, it's yeah. not that I can't stand them. I'm just like, it's fine. But it just doesn't. I don't find it to be emotional music. I find it to be, mm. to me, it's more like Rush. Like, I can't do Rush. Mm. It does, it just, to me, uh, it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't give me what, doesn't I, do what it. I want in that genre. And I do listen to, it's weird because I do have, have music I listen to that I don't think is emotional. I listen to a fair bit of jazz, which I don't find to be very emotional. Um, I, listen to a lot of death metal, which is not an emotional genre within metal. Uh, um, but I think both those have all the other elements of music I really like. Um, mm -hmm. And then my non-metal tastes are really difficult to understand. Like, I feel like people are, it's very hard to predict. Uh, um, yeah, I'm always happy to give music recs, but just like... Uh, I get people ask for generic metal wrecks. I'm, I'm, I get too, I have too many. I could, I could name, name a thousand things. So listen to Inter Arma, you know, mm -hmm. see what you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, start from a couple Inter of names a that tough, you, you if mentioned. If you, based on what songs you say you like, I'll have different wrecks. But yeah, uh, yeah, you know, um, well, I saw a show last night. It's a band called Botch, which is like a, sort of like a, when when '90s hardcore music started delving more into metal. One of the big bands of that genre were Botch. Um, so besides Neurosis and Inter Arma, um, my other favorite band is a band called Converge, um, which is much more popular than uh, Inter Arma and Neurosis. Um, and they're kind of in that same family of bands as 
botch. Um, so that that's also something I often recommend because I, a lot of people like Converge. It's kind of people who like a uh, um, fair bit of Magic players who are like came out of like the punk hardcore scene and like end up listening to like emo. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I noticed recently that uh, Jim Davis, you know who that is, the Magic player. Yes. Yes. I had been hyping this band called Dreamwell on Twitter, and then he had responded to me at some point saying he really liked him. And then I saw a photo from like pro tour coverage where he was wearing a dream well shirt. I was like, yeah. Um, so yeah, I have him. a million recommendations. Yeah. So it's just hard to narrow down. Um, it's, it's a, it music is, there's so much music in the world. And I think that's a big, that's the big change that people don't really appreciate that. Um, music just isn't monolithic as it used to be. Like people are not all listening to the same stuff. So uh, even among my friends, like I said, we have a, a Discord channel of just Magic players who listen to metal. Like the overlap from one person to the next is like not that high. Um, yeah, it, you just kind of like find. I mean, it's got to be just like saying I like pop music or rock music. Like, there's not a lot of overlap that's necessarily built in. Right. Right. Uh, people because they don't know anything about these like metal and metal adjacent genres they don't realize how wide that is like um oh i just assume yeah. every genre is wide because there's just right. as you said there's so much music out there and it's been decades of growth so it's like there's got to be yeah. like something for everybody yeah, every genre is incredibly know? wide like if someone tells you they like indie rock you're like you mean like indie rock like, like with, you can't with even guitars or like not guitars like yeah, yeah. or people electronic yeah. music that's like well there's 50 sub genres that's... of electronic music so which, yeah. which one is it um, exactly so and it's hard yeah. and it's and it's and for someone who doesn't naturally think they like metal, there's no chance you're gonna like as many subgenres as I do, right? Like I, I very much naturally gravitate towards this kind of music. So I have really wide tastes within metal. I think a lot of other people probably could enjoy bits and pieces, but you gotta like pinpoint it. Um Yeah. But if you're coming yeah. from like a I like classic rock, then it's like easier. But if you're like, I wanna try something new um then it becomes harder if you tell me like punk mm. rock there's stuff i could suggest if you tell me like industrial mm. music there's stuff i could suggest um uh but yeah the vocals are tough people people really hate mm. the vocals that's what i've learned over the years mm. yeah okay okay all right my next question for you is that it's kind of related to this like i understand that you go to a lot of live concerts a lot of live shows like up to maybe a hundred a year uh 100 might be high but hundreds on the high end okay um i understand you have a spreadsheet to help you schedule and prioritize choose the shows like can you tell me about your process for oh for that? well that honestly that's more for other people because what happens is i i've I over i've had multiple spreadsheets over the years i actually have one for my coworkers now uh, that I have, I need to update because I've been lazy about it. But what happens is I want to go to so many shows um, and other people want to come to some, but they just are not as invested as I am. So they just can't keep track of what's happening. So I'm just like, okay, look, I'm going to make you a calendar. We're all going to have access to it. And you will always be able to check when all the shows are because I just want to go to shows with people. So I go to a lot of shows alone though, a lot. Uh, um, over the over these years where I've been in New York, um, these past That's six fine. years, I used to do that. Yeah. I go to movies alone too yeah. sometimes. Yeah. So, so yeah, at times I have had to make spreadsheets. Every once in a while, like it's sometimes it's for myself as well. Um, uh, but it's often because I want some other people to actually like be able to plan around it as well, and I find that I just have to help them do that because. It's more important to me than it is to them, so I might as well help them. But yeah, sometimes there's so many shows okay. that the, that the so it's for it's for other people. Like you know, you want to go to these shows, the and um, it's just a matter but, of. But yeah, when publishing. you want to go to as many shows as I want to go to, the scheduling really does become an issue. Like, I've had so many times where I buy tickets to a show, and then another show gets announced on that day, and I'm like, okay, do I want to switch it up? Am I just gonna let those tickets burn, or like? Um, I have to do a lot of like, uh, the Philly, New York thing can get a, like, if there's a show in, every once in a while I get really burned for the shows like 
Thursday in Philly and Friday in New York. So in order to see it, I have to like alter my normal schedule. I either have to go back to Philly early and then maybe work from home on Friday, which I don't enjoy, or I have to stay in New York Friday night and go home a day late, which my wife does not enjoy. Um, I'm actually in New York right now because I have a show last night, tonight, and tomorrow that I, so I just mm. didn't go back to Pennsylvania this weekend. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do go to so many shows that it becomes a, uh, a, a significant scheduling issue. I, 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 I mm. you know, my wife and I get into disagreements about how many of my vacation days get used, um, on music, on music and, shows, and, and yeah. there's no question it, 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 I mean, obviously because of, um, the dirt wizard discord, this is a common discussion. Like it, if I'm going to burn a vacation day, would I, people ask me to go to magic tournaments. People want me to go to eternal weekend. Um, and it becomes like, well, if we were all going to go somewhere some weekend, would I rather do a magic tournament? Or would we rather go to these shows that are all in one city on one weekend where, um, where we know we'd have fun. And usually now I pick music because, um, I think because of my career as a trader and because of how much time I spent playing poker and because of how much time I spent playing magic, uh, I know that if me and my friends go somewhere for a weekend to go see music, I know we're going to have a great time. I know that if I fly across the country to play magic, I might get manuscript screwed in round four and five. Yeah. And you may or may not have a great time. And yeah. I could probably still have a great time. Uh, but at some point, and this actually led when I, when I took a year and a half off work a few years ago, I guess 2016, um, that was a big driving force that I, that I, I did very much get tired of random events affecting my happiness so much. So whether or not I got mana screwed or whether or not my trades at work went well, or whether or not a poker session went well, determining whether I was happy that day or the next day, I really got tired of that. So I really tried to push my life more towards um, removing that element. So I can't remove it from work. I'm stuck with that at work. Um, I mean, honestly, it's part of why I became less of a sports fan as well, because. Yeah. You don't control how the teams end up yeah, playing. And, and you start to realize it's just like, I've been watching these random events on pseudo random events unfold for 30 yeah. years. And I'm tired of just randomly being unhappy because of it. Uh, I, right. Right. I got back into the Phillies this year for the playoffs. And uh, it didn't end well. And I was just like, why did I do this to myself? I could have just been listening mm -hmm. to music this whole time. But I'd be totally happy right, right. now. Uh, it's not like you don't have other things you can share with others and talk about and enjoy yeah. together, right? So, so yeah, the, the um, music has become, yeah. But the scheduling is complex enough where sometimes you need to have a spreadsheet. So mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. the only one. I've, I've had people at shows show me their spreadsheet. So I'm not the only one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, how, my last question for you, maybe, maybe kind of a lighthearted one. Um, do you have to wear earplugs when you go to these shows? Like, is it, is I, it decibel I, level? I highly recommend earplugs. Loud? Yeah. I mean, okay. You don't always, especially with some screaming or certain things. You don't always have to wear them the whole time. So there are some shows where I feel like for my favorite songs, I can take the earplugs out. Um, hearing ears. Ear damage from that level of sound is usually um, the length of time you're exposed to it is pretty meaningful. So like a concert's usually not so loud where if you take out your earplugs for two minutes, you're not fine. Um, but also like not a, a gambling with my hearing, given my interest, in, it's pretty dumb. Uh, but no, I, I wear earplugs the majority of all the shows I go to. I encourage people I go with. I, I, I literally carry earplugs with me for my friends who forget them because they're not used mm. to it or didn't think yeah. about it. Or So I always have extra earplugs yeah. with me. Uh, yeah, you're going to want to wear earplugs at most of these shows. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so Chris, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, it was it was amazing, awesome to, to chat with you. And I'm glad we finally made this work after... Um, me pestering you for 
it, it feels like years or months. No, I, I don't think, know. No, but, I think it literally I, was years. Yeah, I don't think you're exaggerating. I think yeah. it was years. So because yeah. every time I every time I uh, I feel like giving up, I'm just like, no, I want to talk to Chris Petula. So, so let's just keep nagging right. him until one day he tells me, James, just stop yeah. asking me, and you block me. But thankfully, that didn't yeah. happen. So I'm glad we got we made it happen. Yeah, I mean, I do really yeah. like talking. I, I could literally do this for three more hours, which no one would listen to. So it's probably not a good idea. But you know, maybe we'll do it again sometime. <laughs> for sure, we should do it again sometime. Yeah, we should definitely dive into some of the uh, some other topics or existing topics. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, okay. thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Humans of Magic. You've made it to the end. Thanks so much. You're awesome. If you'd like to support the show, there are two ways to do so. The first way is the most powerful. Tell a friend. Tell them to check out Humans of Magic. I'd love it if you could spread the word. The second way is to join the Humans of Magic Patreon at patreon.com slash humans of magic. Patreon is the best way to directly support the show from a financial perspective. For as little as $2 a month, you can support me and join the Discord. It gives me the power to keep cranking out new episodes with your favorite magic people. If you want to go the $5 support route, you'll get a digital copy of the Humans of Magic book. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you, as always, making it all the way to the end, and we'll see you next time.